All right, you're at the inaugural Forager Summit, and we have seven hours of foraging programming for you up ahead. Um, we have some lovely speakers, some lovely guests. We have interviews, presentations, um, tons of information is going to be coming your way. Definitely grab a notebook, um, check out these people on their social media pages and support them. And this is just all about networking people together who have common visions for earth care, foraging, um, just people who are um, want to regenerate this planet. So this is what this is all about is really bringing us together so that we can um, work towards that common goal. And um, yeah, we're really excited to be bringing this to y'all today. So um, I got to give a big shout out to Kyle for coming up with this idea several months ago. It was a brainchild of his when we were having a clubhouse meeting and doing sort of these foraging weekly talks for a little bit over the summertime. And Kyle briefly mentioned it to me and I said, yeah, let's do it. And then summertime got away from me, mushroom hunting and all the different foraging stuff um, was taking my attention. And then Kyle brought it back this winter time and said, hey, let's, let's do the Forager Summit. And I said, all right, let's go. All of a sudden we made a logo, got a budget set out, started talking about presenters and getting excited. And once we had our logo and our Facebook event up, all of a sudden there was thousands of people that had seen it. And we were very pleasantly surprised to have such an amazing response. So we're really, really excited about this. And um, as far as just rules for engagement, everyone is on mute right now, except for our presenters and me and Kyle. And if you wanna chat, we're just gonna encourage you for now to chat into the chat box over here, over text. And once people are done with their presentations, I will create a breakout room so that people can go into the breakout room. And if the presenters want to hang around and uh, chat for a little bit after their presentation, you can choose to go into the breakout room and talk for a bit with them because we're gonna be moving along pretty quickly people are done and you might have some lingering questions or just want to chat with someone um, who's one of your favorite foragers or maybe they said something that's exciting for you and you want to ask some more questions so you'll have that option and let's see what else um yeah i guess that's it another thing would be at the end of people's presentation we're going to leave several minutes for people to be able to ask questions um to the presenters so once that happens, save your questions for that time, for that last few minutes, because they could get buried in the chat otherwise throughout. So wait for that Q&A to start and then drop your questions. And me and Kyle will be curating questions to ask to the presenters and we'll hopefully get to, get to most people's questions. And like I said, you can have that time in the breakout room if the presenter wants to keep talking afterwards. So um, yeah, hopefully that all makes sense. Feel free to ask me and Kyle questions as things go through if you're having any um functional issues uh, we'll do our best to resolve them and as far as the recording um, that's one of our frequently asked questions we are making a recording it's going right now and we will have those recordings available by the end of the month the very latest hopefully sooner than that we'll let you guys know and those recordings will be sent to the email that you signed up through the eventbrite with all right so i think that's all i got anything on your end kyle that you want to mentioned before we get going with Jeremy and Susan? Well, I did just want to, um, well, thank you for, you know, putting everything together and making everything happen like that. And um, um, yeah, well, I'm super excited to kick everything off. And I know it's going to be a lot of good information, a lot of different perspectives and people coming from all over the country and from the world. And um, yeah, with that, um, I'd really like to uh, introduce a friend of mine, a teacher and a mentor as well. Um, Jeremy here is, um, he's been working with the Western Shasta Resource Conservation District for about almost 15 years. And he does a lot of work um, in conservation, creek restoration, habitat restoration, that sort of stuff. Um, and he makes wood duck boxes. So Jeremy. All right, everybody, this is uh, me and my long-term friend Susan here. Uh, we're honored to kick off this foraging summit with our presentations 
we're both a little more comfortable with in person. This is both our first Zoom presentation. <laughs> in fact, I'm more comfortable talking to a thousand people in person than doing a small staff meeting on Zoom. So bear with me here, but uh, just breaking out of my comfort zone and thankful for the invite from Kyle and Brian. And so I'm gonna talk to you folks about land stewardship, open space conservation, and more specifically conservation easements. So uh, like Kyle mentioned, I've worked for the Western Shasta Resource Conservation District for a number of years. And I'll tell you a little bit about RCDs in general. So each county has its own resource conservation district. And the RCDs have their roots in the, out, coming out of the depression all the uh, the dust bowl, the erosion and soil loss from all the bad land practices. RCDs were created to bring federal and state funding and technical assistance to farmers and ranchers so they could voluntarily conserve water, soil, and wildlife habitat on their land with the help of a local neutral partner. So that's the key there. RCDs do not manage lands like the National Park Service or the Forest Service. They are, uh, we work with public agencies, private landowners, local and federal and state, all different agencies to implement conservation and restoration projects on land, but the RCD does not manage lands. So that's a key there. Um, like I said before, they had their roots in strictly soil conservation, but now today the RCDs cover all aspects of restoration and conservation. And all the RCDs have a different, somewhat different focus depending on what their local resources are. And they can include habitat restoration, forest health, healthy soils, public education, landscape scale conservation planning, climate resilience and assisting mun mun municipalities and state in managing water use and preparing for drought and fire. And I pulled that statement off of the California Association of Resource Conservation Districts, which is the general entity that manages all of the county resource conservation districts. So, now that I've told you that RCDs don't manage lands, when we talk about conservation easements, somebody does manage those lands. So the RCD works in partnership with the Shasta Conservation Fund, which is like a land trust, which manages conservation easements and open spaces. So I'm fortunate in the work that I do with the RCD that I also work for the Shasta Conservation Fund. And so the Shasta Conservation Fund is a 501c3 nonprofit that manages conservation easements in partnership with the RCD. So the Shasta Conservation Fund manages the endowments that creates funding for the monitoring and maintenance for these conservation easements. We also do public outreach and education, which I'm doing right here. I'm talking to you folks about what we do. And stressing the importance of conservation of open spaces. And um, we contract, the SCF contracts with the RCD for monitoring and maintenance of those areas. So how do we get to this point? Past land practices, unlimited people generally thought in the beginning of, on this continent, resources were unlimited. You know, trees, fish, water, and they just thought that it would go on forever. So that there's the unregulated extraction of those resources. And public and private landowners could basically do anything they wanted on their land. If you wanted to clear cut it, you could clear cut it. If you wanted to build a bridge across this creek, you could. If you wanted to drive across the creek, you could. And so what that did is there were no best management practices. <laughs> for conservation and people just, you know, do what they wanted to do. And because of that, there was no mitigation strategies, no best management practices. 
it led to a decline in natural resources. And that would be the eradication and extinction of wildlife, um, degraded forests, soil erosion, polluted waterways. And because of that, you know, in a short period of time, say 100 years, people started noticing these things. And uh, about 100 years ago, people started recognizing that we needed to set land aside. And that's how the National Park Service was created. That's how we got uh, federally regulated forests. Uh, Aldo Leopold was the very first leader of chief of the Forest Service. He was also probably our most uh, famous conservationist. So it was, it was actually quite a while ago that it was recognized that the resources were not unlimited. And then, you know, 50 years later, during the 1970s, there's a more public awareness. You have uh, Earth Day, the Clean Water Act, and that led to the alphabet of agencies that we have today. We have the California Air Resources Board. We have the State Water Resources Control Board. We have the Army Corps of Engineers. And the list goes on. And every one of these agencies is monitoring the use of our natural resources, which is good because now people can't just clear cut a forest. They can't just bulldoze their way through a stream. We, and you look at the construction sites today, they have to put up silt fences. We don't just let soil erosion flow into the waterways uncontrolled. So that's a good thing. And um, I want to talk a little bit about the difference between some of the words that we use. So preservation is um, not altering something from his historic or present condition. So if you're going to preserve your land, you're not going to alter it. That's the mission of the National Park Service. So in regards to foraging, it's going to be difficult to forage in most national parks because they're not altering their landscape. They don't issue permits for collecting. Susan and I both um, volunteer. In fact, she's the president of our local chapter of the Native Plant Society. We cannot, however, collect seeds from the National Park Service because we can't get a permit because they don't allow that. So that's a good example of preservation. Leave it alone, don't touch it, don't take from it, don't change it. And it's kept that way to preserve the resources for perpetuity. So preservation, we covered that. Restoration is another word that people use a lot and that's restoring to its previous condition or better than what it is now. And that's, you know, fire rehabilitation, stream restoration, erosion control measures to seed and straw. These are all things that are restoring the environment. So we do a lot of restoration work. And then the last one, conservation is, is the word that I'm most favorable of because Conservation is the sustainable use of our natural resources. And as foragers, that's the word that we want to focus on mostly is conservation of these resources. We want to use them. We want to utilize them. We don't want them off limits, but we also want to use them wisely and sustainably. We want our practices to help sustain the resource for the future, for perpetuity, for the people that come after us. So it's a good idea to, to get those words separate because when you're out foraging, you're going to find out there, you know, the, the land that you want to forage from is going to be managed by some sort of entity. And so that's something you want to know about when you're foraging. So um I see. So as far as open space goes, there are different categories of open space. You've all seen, you know, public open space of parks, 
County and community parks, walking trails that are shared with bikes and dogs, also shared with the native species that are contained in those areas. And those areas are usually less regulated. So it's pretty much, you know, open to the public to do a variety of recreational activities. Conservation easements, on the other hand, their mitigation for a loss or disturbance of habitat due to human related activities. For example, here in Reading, we have bridges over the Sacramento River all over the place. And bridge maintenance seems to be an ongoing thing for the whole 20 years I've lived up here. So they started with a one lane bridge and horse and carriages. Then it was a two lane bridge for Model Ts. Then we had four lane bridges. Now we have six lane bridges in the future. I see 10, 12 lane bridges, but it's probably just gonna be an ongoing thing with bridge construction here. So every time they rehabilitate a bridge or create a new bridge or expand a bridge, there is a corresponding loss of habitat over the river, which is usually riparian, but it could be wetland. So as mitigation for that habitat loss, California Department of Transportation is required to mitigate that loss by restoring usually a larger area than what they, they damaged or destroyed. So that's a lot of the work that I am involved in with conservation easements are specific mitigation projects that are resource, uh, <clears throat> so they're replacing the resources that were lost due to that, that construction. And they are strictly regulated to protect the resources. So that's the difference between common open space and a conservation easement is that Open space is less regulated and conservation easements are strictly regulated. So the benefits of these conservation easements are that they preserve and protect the native species and the natural resources within our developed communities. So these are generally the ones that I'm working with are within developed areas inside the city, open space, natural areas that are set aside to protect natural resources within our city. And so I talked about the benefits of those, but some, there's a lot of challenges with these areas because in the absence of fire, we're right in the middle of the city, there's fuel reduction, buildup of brush species, grass, thatch, and trees. And it's really difficult to implement projects within these conservation easements because of that the ABC of agencies I was just telling you about, you have to coordinate with the city of Reading, the Army Corps of Engineers, possibly the water or air control board, and then the private landowner, because these easements are owned by a landowner as well. And so that makes it difficult to implement any type of project on there, because once again, these are areas being preserved preserved for the perpetuity. So it's difficult to change them. Anything we do as humans is, is changing it. So they're managed under the preservation of uh, natural resources. And so that makes it difficult because there's also, um, these are natural areas. There's non-native species coming in there's transients, there's camps, there's litter, there's vandalism. And so a lot of the time we're dealing with monitoring what's changing in the conservation easement, but we're not necessarily able to address the problems. So as the agency managing the conservation easement, it's great to be able to set these areas aside. We also have to figure out a better way to manage them. And because they are areas that are preserved, it's difficult to say to people, you invite them in and say, yes, come walk your dog, come forage, come hike or visit through here because there's small areas set aside for the natural resource. 
which could be songbirds, it could be small critters, it could be lizards, it could be protecting the stream or wetland or vernal pool in that area. So in actuality, these conservation easements are better left untouched, better left unvisited by humans. So I just wanted to bring that up because um, it's just an important thing to make note about some of the areas that you might visit is that, you know, being a responsible forager, working under the concept of stewardship and sustainability, you want to do a little homework about the area that you're going to visit. And you want to take into consideration who is the landowner? What are the regulations that that mission, the, the mission that that agency operates under? And try to follow within those guidelines and be aware of that just to protect yourself, but also to protect the resources within that area. And I'm really glad to have this audience because this is a message I think you'll all be very receptive to as you know, people that are having awareness of our environment. It's really difficult message to sell to people up here in the North State of California because there is so much open space. There's so many green belts and it's just, it seems really, these areas seem really common and not that special. But I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area and during my lifetime, I watched all the fields that I play in become apartment complexes. I watched all the streams that I played in go underground and become culverts. Now I've been up here for 20 years and I'm seeing the same thing happen. So it's just, it's a hard, it's a hard concept to sell, but um, you know, that's my message. It's open space is valuable and priceless and irreplaceable. You can you can put a price on a new stadium or a new dam or a new um, city hall. You can't put a price on a field with an oak tree with some wild species hanging out right in the middle of your city. But it's, it's more valuable than the building, I can tell you that. So I'm gonna get back to my notes here. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the um, missions of the different public agencies, because this is where most we can do most of our foraging is on public land. And so the National Park Service mission statement preserves unimpaired the natural and cultural resources and values of the national park system for the enjoyment, education, and inspiration of this and future generations. So in a nutshell, protection and preservation is the primary duty of that agency. Therefore, you're not likely gonna get a permit to forage. We can't get a permit to collect seeds. We don't necessarily like that, but we just go somewhere else where we can do it. The Bureau of Land Management. Now their mission is to sustain the health, diversity and product productivity of public lands for the use and enjoyment of present and future generations. So the BLM produces resources, minerals, mining, oils, oil production, and also foraging with a permit. You can get a permit from the BLM to collect mushrooms or rocks or you know, whatever you want to, pine cones, anything. So, so if you're looking for <laughs> lands to forage on, we've got all kinds of BLM land that we can forage, legally forage. Now the US Forest Service, which is the bulk of land, public land, is their mission is to sustain health, diversity, and productivity of the nation's forests and grasslands to meet the needs of present and future generations. So historically, and even now, the Forest Service is managed under the Department of Agriculture, which is trees. You wouldn't think about it as agriculture, but trees are agriculture. So timber harvest, timber production, mm -hmm. recreation, and thankfully foraging because that's the bulk of our public land. So, you know, if you're looking for mushrooms, you can go to the Forest Service, you can get a permit, and then you're good to go. So you've got federal, state, and local lands. You've got public and private. And then there's also many private opportunities and those are just ranches, farms, um, your own yard. So I think I wanna switch over to talking about 
public outreach and education and primarily one of the projects I'm involved in. So um, if you don't have a connection to the land, it's really difficult to care about what happens on the land. And as technology increases, it's great. We're here on Zoom, we're talking to people across the, the nation, you know, it's great, but electronic devices are starting to occupy everybody's day from the minute they wake up, from the minute they're born, basically. People are losing their connection with the outdoors and the land. And so as part of the outreach and education that I do, I wanna bring that and share it with people. I wanna share that with young people and get them interested in the outdoors and our valuable local native plants and animals because you know you get people outdoors, you get them learning things at a young age. That's how they get that excitement, that passion. And if you don't teach them that when it's time to conserve and to cons conserve these lands or protect them, if they don't have that connection, if they don't have that experience, they're just not going to have the passion for it. So um, I did a fundraiser and I raised some money to buy materials and supplies for a local charter school to build wood deck nesting boxes in their wood shop. And then I read another small grant for some trail cameras. So in a nutshell, our project is to have the students build wood deck nesting boxes. And then they also have a construction crew. So we're gonna go around and install these boxes at local ponds where we have nesting wood ducks. And then we're gonna monitor those boxes with the trail cameras for wood ducks and other wildlife that's out there deer, turkeys, other waterfowl, squirrels, lizards, whatever we can catch. And the students will be heading up all of this. They're gonna build the boxes. They're gonna install them. They're gonna do monitoring and maintenance on the boxes. We're gonna bring the trail cam videos back into the classroom. We've got a YouTube channel set up so we can broadcast it to other students and other schools and home schools and all this stuff. So. That's the current project I'm working on for the Shasta Conservation Fund in regards to public outreach and education. And um, so if you guys follow, if you guys look me up on Facebook, I've got a page called Shasta Conservation Fund. I've also got a website that I'm not having done much with, but it's on the internet too, Shasta Conservation Fund. And So I've got a few minutes left. I want to tell you guys a quick story. I saved this story so if my presentation ran short. It looks like I got just enough time to tell it. If everybody could see that tree on the screen right, right there, that tree, uh, just as a side note, I have a side job at night. I deliver pizzas for extra money just because it's fun and easy. But it's also a job I started doing when my kids were small before I started in school. So this tree right here has, is a special friend of mine because I've worked in close proximity to this tree for 20 years now. And um, that tree right there has a special story to me. And this is connection to the land. So a hundred years ago, this area right here was a mag majestic, magnificent valley oak forest, huge trees. And then as people developed this area, they had the railroad. So about a hundred years ago for a 50 year period, the oak trees on both sides of the railroad for five or 10 miles on either side were cut down as fuel for the railroad. So, you know, that, majestic oak forest disappeared. When they opened up the canopy, it just, these species are resilient, they reproduce. So when you open the canopy, it creates a pocket for a new tree. This tree right here, I guess, to be somewhere between 50 and 100 years old. So my guess, and I'm just making this up as I go, because I really love to look at the land and try to interpret what's happened over the last hundred years. That's just one of my favorite things to do. I actually do it while I'm driving around delivering pizzas. And I, I look at this tree and I go, okay, so they cut down all the all the old, old growth trees. That, that created a, a niche for this tree. So this tree was born 
during that time when they eliminated eliminated that majestic oak forest for the railroad, which is literally just 0.5 miles to the west. And so that tree, um, looking at this picture, it tells me a number of things about the environment. First off, I look at that tree and I know valley oaks grow in alluvial stream deposits. So that's great soil right there. And the water table is fairly shallow because valley oaks need water. They're not like blue oaks or black oaks or canyon live oaks. These trees grow right where the water table is shallow. Well, the Sacramento River is 0.5 miles to the north. So we're in the remnants of an ancient valley oak forest. And um, there's coffee berry shrubs all around the bottom of this tree. And, and this, tree, this field gets mowed every year. And so that tells me that that tree is serving as wildlife habitat for several birds that like to eat coffee berries and race there at night and deposit the seeds. And so that's why we have a little coffee berry forest in the understory canopy of that tree. Yeah, those are all coffee berries, yeah. And um, so what that tells me about coffee berries is they're shade tolerant because that tree right there provides a lot of shade. It also tells me that coffee berries are resistant to the tannins in the oak tree leaves, which other, other plants, say lawn, can't, can't tolerate that tannin. So those species have developed together over time. Um, so if you look directly behind the tree, you'll see a power, um, power line structure and directly behind that is I-5. So this particular tree over the last 50 or 100 years of its life has witnessed, you know, I-5 that was built in the 1950s or 60s. And then the power, the power line, which came sometime after that, probably 60s or 70s. <laughs> and somehow this tree wasn't damaged or removed during all that construction. So it's, it's a survivor. As far as oak trees go, it's an adolescent. It's 50 to 100 years. They can live three to 500 years. So it's a, if this tree were, is able to stay here, it could live for a couple hundred more years. As far as the for sale sign in the corner of the picture, I'm a little concerned about the future of this tree because it's got round table pizza on the left hand side and it's got Popeye's chicken on the right hand side. And I can guarantee you there will be a Taco Bell or something else in the middle of it. So, you know, in this line of work, it's great because you're always doing something great for the environment. But there are bad days, you know, the day, if, if this tree does, if this lot does sell and they build something there and they remove that tree, it's going to be a bad day for me because I have a connection to this tree. You know, it's, it's going to be a little bit of a loss. And there are times doing this work when you feel defeated because if I have a bad day doing pizza, it's usually somebody got their pizza wrong or their order was late. It's fixable. But if I have a bad day at work in my day job with the conservation easement, something priceless and irreplaceable has usually just been damaged or lost for good. But that's not really the message I wanna leave you guys on. I wanna leave you guys with the message of hope. So, you know, when the car fire devastated Whiskey Town Park in Reading in 2018, I was extremely hesitant to go back to the park because I have more tree friends there than I have real people friends in the, in the <laughs> real life, you know, and, and I don't know anybody that people that died in the car fire, but I was very hesitant to go back and see how many of my favorite trees I lost up there. And each time I go back, back up there, I visit a different area just to take that loss in a little bit at a time. And, uh, my wife and I just visited an area where one of my favorite trees lived and we pulled up and I could see right away that the tree was gone, died in the fire. I mean, it's still there. It was just killed off by the fire. And I mean, it's a magnificent, magnificent uh, canyon live oak growing on the edge of the stream. And it's probably 200 years old. So it's a middle-aged oak tree. It would probably live for 200 more years. 
with being right by the stream and had the fire not gotten a hold of it. So we walked, we walked over to the stream and the dog started playing. And my wife was walking and I just stood by the tree and I looked at it and I was feeling that loss. And I noticed, of course, you know, these are native plants. They're resilient. They're fire adapted. This is, uh, I look at the tree and it's actually sprouting from the roots, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh, he's not dead. <laughs> he's not dead. So, I mean, looking at the tree, I'm sad because this is a magnificent specimen. And that's what attracted me to that tree in the first place was this is an old growth giant oak tree that's lived to see the whole gold California gold rush and everything we've done up to date. And now it's dead. It is not dead. The fire actually gave that tree a new lease on life because now instead of being a middle-aged tree, it's a baby tree again. It's still <laughs> the same tree. It's going to live. And it just, it made me happy because it made me realize that, you know, my human life is only this big. And that oak tree has been there before me and it'll be there long after I'm gone. So I was happy and I didn't feel sad. And it made me feel like there's a lot of things I could do in this world. And I'm happy <laughs> with what I do. I think I'm gonna end my presentation now and let give you guys a little bit of time for questions because we got about nine minutes before Susan starts. Thank you for that, Jeremy. That was, uh, I really uh, um, appreciate that story. And it just kind of goes to show that, um, you know, we all develop these relationships with the land and, you know, we start to know each trees as individuals. And uh, even if they're the same species of tree, you know, they're not the same. They're not just the same. They're all unique in their own way. And we can develop a relationship with them just like we can with humans. Uh, yeah, we got a couple of questions here in the chat. Um, we uh, have one from uh, Mikara. It, um, this person asks, uh, is it considered ethical if we confirm the area we forage in is appropriate and allowed to over harvest the invasive species, even if it would leave a void? Or how would you address um, harvesting or void? Well, I'll be honest with you. I mean, any rules that man makes, they're just rules. You know, I've, laws are laws, regulations are regulations. I personally, I'm not the, the regulation police. And in regards to invasive species, I would, yeah, say a weed is a weed if it's interfering with something we do. A weed may not be a weed in regards to wildlife habitat or the surroundings. It's a difficult question because I'm here representing the Resource Conservation <laughs> District. And as Susan will say too, we're all about public safety, conserving the resource and following the laws and regulations. We have to, as a private individual, when it comes to invasive species, even certain plants like willow, it's really difficult to harm those trees. They are adapted to disturbance and harvesting. So, I would say that you just use your best judgment. Um, it, nothing would ruin a great foraging day worse than getting a thousand dollar fine for grabbing a couple mushrooms out, out or something, or even whatever species you might be thinking in regards to. I can't say for sure. Um, I would follow the laws and regulations. I would look for places where what you want to do is allowed and that's my official position on it because it wouldn't be right for me to say something different. But with, re with respect to invasive species, like that's their weeds, so they're gonna reproduce. You have a different question? Yeah, there's another one. Um, um, Mikara, the same person is asking if there's a page or a website that gives a breakdown of all the different agencies and each of their allowances or intentions. Um, like, is there an online directory? I would say that where I got my information is to Google whatever agency. So the first thing would be to identify the landowner of a particular place you wanna go. 
And if it's the Forest Service, you would look on that local Forest Service website and you'll find some, some phone numbers to call that local office where you want to get a say permit to harvest a Christmas tree or a permit to collect mushrooms or a permit to collect rocks. And then you'll find that out. You'll find that out. Yeah, and um, yeah, we have another one here. Um, well, uh, yeah, we had a comment. Um, Amelia was saying that she doesn't think that it's right for the government to tell us we're not allowed to forage on the public land. And I think you did speak a little bit to that sentiment um, already. Yeah, um, well, like I said before, I'm not the police about it. And in my own private opinion, I would probably say the same thing as her. And I feel like most foragers are gonna use their common sense. And if you're walking along and you see one of my personal favorites, which is mustard, and you're gonna grab it, just grab mustard wherever you see it. It's just a weed. It's a great weed. It's a cover crop. It has forage value for all kinds of wildlife, including humans. And you can grab mustard all day long. You're not going to hurt mustard. I can't tell you that as a resource conservation district employee. So, you know, use your common sense, folks. I'm not the police. I wouldn't, I'm not going to tell you what you can and can't do. The whole goal of my presentation was for you to be aware that there's different practices on public land and it's in your benefit to know that. Yeah, it's it's good to know, um, you know, what regulation, I mean, if you're gonna follow them or not, I mean, that's, you know, your personal choice, but you should know, um, you know, the, the risks that you're potentially taking, um, you know, that's it's always a good to have that awareness. Um, another question here from uh, Cheryl Sparks is that she says um, she sees a lot of people um, like the van life people um, using BLM for free camping for free camping. And she's wondering about the uh, the impact of those people um, when they do that. We work quite a bit with the BLM here and it usually involves uh um, we're working in the fire damaged lands and the burn car fire burn scar and we're treating invasive species. I'm not particularly involved with their camping policy, but I do know that you can camp for two weeks on BLM property and all you have to do is pull up and move to a different location. You can camp another two weeks. So mm, I don't really have an opinion on it. You know, it's not my, it's not my policy, but as far as the impact that would have, it's probably the same as all the illegal camping and transients and camps, which are responsible for a lot of vandalism, pollution, uh, out of control fires. So it, it's an issue. I, I can't really speak to a solution on it. Yeah. And now, uh... <laughs> Seems like a, it's like kind of a complicated situation. Um, I know up here we see a lot of the like homeless people living in the woods and trash build up everywhere and all that sort of stuff as well. Well, one um, last thing about that, Kyle, I've become a little jaded about it because while they're doing that, I work in the food industry and I just see an equal, if not double, volume of waste plastic waste, consumer waste. And there's, you know, I see oak tree leaves as a resource and nothing bothers me worse than seeing somebody raking them up into a one-time disposable <laughs> plastic bag. Let's just drink some water out of a plastic bottle while we're putting our leaves in a plastic bag and it's all one-time use. And then where does the plastic end up? So, I mean, yeah, those people are out there making a mess in the wild open spaces, but they're humans and they have to live. I wish they would clean them their, up their mess, but how different is it than all the other mess everybody's making just because they put it in a garbage receptacle? Yeah, the trash is going to, you know, it's either going to be here or it's going to be there, you know. Yeah, um, cool. yeah it looks like. 
we have somebody raising their hand here. Well, let's um we need to move on to Susan so that we have time for her. I'm gonna do a quick intro on her and then um we do have a hand raised and it would be good to continue this conversation. So since we have a double presenter situation right now, what we'll do is if y'all want to and feel free to go about your day if, if you know this is too much, but uh Jeremy and Susan, y'all are welcome to hang out afterwards and chat with people. And I'll create a breakout room to um, follow up on any questions with Jeremy. Um, and then I also put in the chat um, that place for people, Jeremy, but if you want to shout out one more time where people can find you and network with you, this would be a good time to do it before I introduce Susan. Okay, great. On Facebook, it's just a conservation fund. And on the internet, it's www.shastaconservationfund.org. All right, great. Thank you. That, that was excellent. Super good to hear. I have so many questions, thoughts, and inspirations I would love to share at some point. So I definitely look forward to chatting more with you. Um, and yeah, let's get on to Susan's presentation. I'm really excited about this. Um, I'll just do a, a brief intro for you, Susan, so people know where you're coming from. Um, but Susan was raised in San Francisco, California, fished locally with her dad. She spent summers with relatives along the Russian River going blackberrying with her aunt and searching the woods for maiden hair with mushrooms during a college trip to Tilden Park in Berkeley, California. She attended the University of San Francisco Humboldt State University with redwoods and Sitka spruce forests nearby and moved to Seattle, Washington to study mushroom taxonomy with Dr. Daniel Stunts and Dr. Joseph Amirati at the University of Washington. She earned the PhD in 1981 for a taxonomic study of oyster mushroom lookalikes. She was the editor of research publications at the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture in Seattle and she has taught botany, biology, and mycology at the University of Washington, Seattle University, and Shasta College in Redding, California. Nowadays, she's interested in public education and speaking and teaching for Shasta College and Shasta Chapter of the California Native Plant Society. So welcome, Susan. We're really excited for your presentation. Thank you, Brian. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Okay. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank all my mentors, all those people that you mentioned. Um, I, I really appreciate uh, uh, Dr. David Largent at Humboldt State University, Dr. Stuntz in Seattle, Washington at the University of Washington, Dr. Joseph Amirati, and um, all the wonderful fellow students, including Joanne Lennox, who was finishing her degree as I started mine and really sort of took me under her wing. So I appreciate all of those people very much. Um, I also want to say some more thanks before I get going here. Thanks to the fantastic photographers who have lent me pictures of my good pictures of the mushrooms that I want to speak about. Um, um, uh, Mr. Woods, uh, Mr. Stevens, and uh, let's see, uh, Lynn Peterson, whose photo of me you see on the front page. Anyway, thanks very much to those people. So let's let's begin. I, I just want to say I would like all of you listeners to end up loving mushrooms at the end of my talk and to um, have enough respect for yourself to use them safely, to make sure you know what you're doing when you try to eat a mushroom, uh, to make sure that you realize that any individual can be allergic, seriously allergic to any individual mushroom. And so that you must, uh, public safety is really my thing. And as president of our local California Native Plant Society, she asked a chapter, um, um, I, I, I'm interested in foraging. I'm interested in supporting foragers to know what plants they're really dealing with and what plants they're thinking of eating. So uh, let's, for, let's go ahead. This is me with snow plant at Mount Lassen National Park. And um, thank you, Lynn Peterson for the photo. We'll talk about snow plant later on in this presentation. Okay. 
Maybe you want to know what a mushroom is. Uh, whether you want to know or not, I guess I'm going to tell you what a mushroom is. So a mushroom is the reproductive structure, the reproductive part of certain kinds of fungus, okay? Oh, so what's that? All right, we won't have, take very long with this idea, but a fungus, the fungal kingdom is one of the five kingdoms of life. I happen to think it's a really cool kingdom, um, but I like the other kingdoms too, especially the animals like us. So fungi either have tiny round bodies like yeasts do, maybe some of you make your own beer or wine and you have to use yeast in order to start that fermentation. Um, other fungi like mushrooms, as you see here on the screen, they're actually composed of fine threads, uh, very fine threads like cobwebs almost that are all glued together. So if you looked at that mushroom under the microscope, you would see that it's composed of all sorts of fine threads just glued together. These mushrooms, however, cannot make their own food. Green plants, as you know, can make their own food, but mushrooms cannot, and they have to break down other organisms once in a while, even us, in order to get their nutrition. All right, so other groups, just for a second, bear with me here, because I think these things are really cool. There's another kingdom called the Archaea, extremely ancient organisms. They still live in the world in the hot springs and in the uh, digestive tracts of cattle. So archaea are still active in the world. Bacteria, you know about, we, a lot of humans are afraid of bacteria. Bacteria cause diseases. We're really worried about this. But without bacteria, well, plants and animals would not be able to, to uh, have their lives. Without bacteria, our food would not be digested in our digestive systems. So bacteria are really good too. Plants, of course, have cellulose cell walls and they can produce their own food. Green plants can. That chlorophyll is active in the plant and it uh, captures sunlight and water and uh, uh, carbon from the air, carbon dioxide from the air through the process of photosynthesis, and they make their own sugars. This is very cool too. And animals, now we can't produce our own food, so we're more like fungi in that way. We have to eat out also. Some people have dairy they come with pizzas so that they can eat out. <laughs> okay, moving along. <laughs> okay, what do fungi do in the world? The fungi are extremely important in helping forests grow. The roots of your forest trees are covered with those fine threads that I was telling you about. Um, the technical term for that is mycorrhizae. The fungus is able to break down uh, dead material in the soil and capture water much better than the tree roots can by themselves. And all of that is funneled into the tree in exchange for a little bit of sugar. So what's not to like about the symbiosis. Um, fungi decompose wood and thereby replenish the soil cycle for carbon. Um, fungi, as we already mentioned, ferment sugars as yeasts do. And some fungi really are pathogens and they do attack living plants and animals. They do attack our forest trees. Okay, this particular fungus is the barometer earth star, which grows um, at my place in Cottonwood, California. And it opens uh, the, the portion in the center has spores, reproductive spores inside, which the rain helps to carry away. Um, the, um, the outer star-like part dries up and protects the spore-bearing sac uh, during dry weather. Then it opens up again. So it is, acts just like a barometer tells you what the weather's doing. Okay, in order to talk about mushrooms, we need to talk about the parts of a mushroom. So this is just a very informal drawing of mine. First of all, the mushroom consists of a cap, a stem or stalk, and a cup, a cup at the base of the mushroom, and then fine threads called rhizomorphs or mycelium. Um, the actual fungus, the active part of the fungus is in the rhizomorphs or mycelium. The mushroom itself is only a reproductive structure. Okay, warts. And I, the reason I make a point of this is in order to be able to identify fungi with a field guide or whatever, you have to know what the 
author is talking about. You have to know what portions when they say that there's warts on the cap. You have to look and see if there's warts on the cap of your mushroom so that you can tell if it matches the one in the book. Okay, warts on the cap. The cap, which supports the gills, um, the spores are formed on the surfaces of those gills. They look like they're very fine, like face powder. Um, there's a stem or stalk. Sometimes, not always, there's a ring around the stalk. Um, there's sometimes, but not always, there's a cup at the base of the stalk. You, when you're collecting mushrooms, you need to dig carefully around the mushroom so you don't destroy that portion of it. If you're trying to identify a mushroom, you have to be able to see all the features to safely and correctly identify it. And so you must carefully collect it so you can look at it. And then the rhizomorphs, which are really, as I say, the active, the biologically active part of this organism. Okay, now back to collecting, since we are foraging, right? And I'm, I, I want to say thanks right now to Jeremy Kelly for being the technological person that made it possible for me to do my first Zoom presentation. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, Jeremy is an awesome forager. And we, we had a mushroom class a few years ago, and he brought in many interesting specimens for all the students to see, which I very much appreciated. OK. Uh -uh. You're going to have to do some homework. You're going to have to decide where you would like to go mushrooming, figure out whether it's BLM land or um, a state uh, park or what, and then look up the regulations for mushroom collecting in that area. Um, and for example, in California right now, I believe there's only one state park that allows mushroom collecting. The other state parks do not allow it. Um, that one state park is very strictly, of course, they're getting a lot of interest, and they're very strictly observing limits on mushroom collecting, which is about five pounds. Um, people, even if it's not an edible fungus that you're collecting, even if you're just collecting specimens to, let's say, for a show, a mushroom show or something, if you exceed that five pound limit, you're looking at a thousand dollar fine or many hours of community service if you can't pay the fine, if you have the uh, option for that. So anyway, just be aware where you are and what the regulations are and the limits are in the place where you uh, would like to collect. Get your permits. Oh, uh, Jeremy, mushroom Jeremy's, <laughs> Jeremy is showing off his large dry mushroom specimen. It's one mushroom, five pounds. <laughs> one mushroom, five pounds. That can happen. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. Get your permits. Um, pay attention to where you, okay, public safety is the story, the song that I sing to you all day. Um, Pay attention to where you are. When you're looking, walking along, looking at the ground, looking for mushrooms, it's really easy to get lost in the woods. And the even experienced mushroomers have this happen all the time. Those of you who spend time in the woods, you might not tell everybody about the time that you walked the wrong way for a mile before you realized you were going the wrong way to get out. But I think it's happened to all of us. So be very careful, keep, keep your compass with you, you know, I can't, because cell phones don't work everywhere. I'm sure you've discovered this. All right. <clears throat> when you're collecting the fungus, dig it up very carefully to be sure you get all those parts. So you're going to be able to identify it later. Bring with you a reasonable collecting gear. And in a moment, I'll show you what that looks like. So you need a bag or a box or a basket to hold your mushrooms. You don't want to get home with them all smashed so that you can no longer identify them. Uh, wrap individual, my recommendation is that you wrap individual kinds of mushrooms separately in waxed paper, not plastic, not plastic bags, because they re rot really quickly when they're in plastic. They'll, they'll last a long time in waxed paper and you can put them in the fridge and keep them for even longer. <clears throat> okay, for you, you need the usual things that you should have with you when you're walking in the woods. A compass, a map, water, snacks, a whistle, a mirror, light, some kind of first aid essentials, and maybe a space blanket. Okay. All right, here's my collecting gear. Maybe you want a bag. Um, so that's this happens to be a cloth bag that you see sitting on top of my old mushrooming basket. Then this is roomy enough to get, put a whole lot of specimens in. 
Okay, we're making the point again. Please wrap your mushrooms in wax paper. There's a roll of wax paper in the second photograph sticking out of the basket. Um, <clears throat> I bring along an old table knife you can get at a secondhand store for 10 cents for digging mushrooms out of the ground to make sure you get those underground parts. Okay, um, a pencil and pen and paper and cards uh, for uh, to note where you found the mushroom. To note if you if you happen to be removing a mushroom from a tree trunk, uh, to note what what kind of tree it was removed from, and to start your spore prints while you're still in the field. If you start making your spore prints. Um, while you're still in the field, you might have a, a usable spore print by the time you get back, and that will materially aid in your identification process. I'll show you about spore prints in the next slide. Okay, your first aid essentials, compass map, water snacks. We need to make a song about this. Compass map, water snacks, whistle, mirror, light, first aid essentials, maybe a space blanket. And I'm telling you um, that a, a garbage sack in your basket is very useful because you can use it as an emergency raincoat. Okay. All right. Here's how to make a spore print. Okay, you really, you almost always need to know the color of the spores of a mushroom. So, first of all, you cut off its head and put it. Um, or cap, as it's called, and uh, put it on a piece of white paper. You do need white because you need to be able to tell colors like pale lavender or very pale brown or yellowish. So you, you can't, it's best to just put it on a little bit of white paper, cover the cap maybe with a glass or bowl and wait overnight. All right, unless thing, the mushroom is too dry already, um, there should be a spore deposit in the shape of the gills by the next morning. And there on the second picture, you see a picture of the spore deposit for this mushroom. Um, the spore deposit is powdery and they rub off the paper easily. So you need to um, be careful with your spore print if you wanna preserve it. Um, the spore color, in this case, this is black. Um, or blackish, which is also a color. Uh, spore color will help you identify the mushroom. Okay, once you've identified the mushroom, be sure you look in your mushroom guide and make sure it's really edible, okay? Uh, even if it's an edible variety, you as an individual, you might have an individual adverse reaction or some sort of allergic reaction to a particular mushroom. Um, we always recommend that you cook the mushroom thoroughly one kind at a time. I know how frustrating this is when people come back with five kinds of mushrooms they want to try, but I recommend to you, you cook one thoroughly. Personally, I really never bother with anything but a little butter. Um, cook the mushroom thoroughly, cut it up, cook it thoroughly, and eat one kind, especially if you're a beginner here. Some mushrooms can be eaten cooked, but are toxic when raw. In fact, the one you're looking at, the bluet, Clytosa nuda, do not eat that mushroom raw. You must cook it. Okay, sorry, but the first time you eat a particular mushroom, you should only eat about a tablespoon of the cooked material. This is just a sensible precaution, but turns out that you have an allergic reaction to this particular mushroom. And then we recommend that you wait overnight and don't eat another kind of mushroom until the next day. And I know how frustrating that can be, but it's a good practice. Yeah, for sure. Moving along. Okay, now I want to scare you. <laughs> Okay, this is, I'm not, this, I am not joking. Mushrooms can kill you and mushrooms kill many people every single year. Every year people make mistakes and die from eating mushrooms. And this is tragic because I would like to prevent this for, through public education. Um, the, sorry, I'm sure this question would otherwise come up. No, there is no easy way to tell whether a mushroom is poisonous or not. You just have to learn to identify it. And then, and that's where the field guides come in or um, online resources. At the end of the talk, I'll show you some online resources that you can use, at least in California. And there's probably others in the other parts of the nation. This particular mushroom is called death cap. Do you know why? Because it can kill you. 
and has killed many people and kills more people every single year. This is our biggest problem as far as mushroom poisoning. Ammonita phalloides is the name of it. And I'm thanking Michael Wood of MycoWeb. MycoWeb is one of the online resources we'll be talking about. And Michael Wood, thank you very much for this photograph. All right, moving on. Okay, the death cap, more about the death cap. Um, this mushroom also is something like a weed. It did not used to occur in Washington state where I did much, much of my studying, um, but it uh, was introduced on an ornamental plant to Berkeley, California. And over the course of 40 years, it has spread all the way up the Pacific coast. So people who were used to foraging for mushrooms and weren't particularly worried about this and that now have to be re-educated to realize that there's a very serious mushroom threat in there area. This particular mushroom is responsible for the majority of mushroom poisonings, fatal mushroom poisonings, that's death, worldwide. But this is the scariest mushroom in the world. Okay, toxins that it has within it, even when cooked, the toxins are still active. They attack your liver. No, I should say they attack your liver first. And then after a while, they move on to your heart and other organs. And um, you do not know that you're ill. This mushroom does not taste bad. It tastes good from what I hear. Um, the, this mushroom does not make you throw up shortly after you've eaten it. It tastes great and it stays down just fine. So 12 hours later, when you begin to have symptoms, the mushroom material is thoroughly incorporated into your system and there's nothing you can do about it that you can go to the emergency room and some people survive by means of lavage and support systems. So some people do survive poisoning with this mushroom, but it's not good. Okay, well, for features, I'd like you to look at the top picture. There's a very young mushroom. There's a big patch on the cap and there's a cup at the base of the stem. That underground cup is very important as I've already mentioned three times. So this is the fourth. And so please be sure you dig this mushroom out so that you can see whether it has that cup or not. Um, there's also a ring around the stem. Let's see, this is a little bit less easy to see uh, there. Okay, there's a rem remnant. See the cap, uh, okay, on the lower photograph on mushroom number one, two, three, four, that's lying flat, you can see uh, some fibers between the cap and the stem. That's all that's left of the ring, which is one of the features you need to know about in order to identify this mushroom. It's a little subtle, subtle on our screen. I'm not sure whether you all can see it, but there it is. Okay, this particular mushroom likes oak woodlands. Okay, and once again, thanks to Darwin DeShazer and the website Mushroom Observer um, for, for lending me these photographs. Okay, um, I'm moving, I'm not gonna show you all the edible and poisonous mushrooms because we'd be here for weeks, but um, I'm going to mention another poisonous mushroom. Lots of people eat boletes. They like boletes. They're rel rel relatively reasonably um, easy, easy to identify, at least to the point that you know it's a bolete. And um, <clears throat> however, some boletes are toxic. Okay, um, they are fleshy mushrooms with pores rather than gills underneath the cap. And I don't see this, this picture isn't high enough resolution to actually see those pores. They're pretty small. They're the size of pinpricks. Okay. Uh -huh. So many boletes are edible, but this particular bolete is poisonous. Um, and it's relatively identifiable uh, in that it has the, the, what we call the pore layer under the cap is red. And then there's also red color at the top of the stem. So um, <clears throat> it also stains blue where it's bruised or cut. I don't have a picture. That looks like blue ink. Somebody dropped blue ink on the mushroom. And so we, and as a general practice, we recommend if you pick a bolete and cut it and it turns blue rapidly, it would be best to avoid it. I have seen this mushroom in the woods around here. You can see they're under oak trees. You can see by the leaves in the photograph that they are in an oak forest finding this particular mushroom. Thank you, Fred Stevens from Michael Webb also. All right. <clears throat> okay, yes, I'll show you an edible mushroom. Uh, this is the very highly prized King Bolete or Boletus edulis. 
Um, the, as we mentioned, boletes have pores beneath the cap, not gills. This king bolete is very desirable. It has a brown cap, as you can see from the upright one. It has pores beneath the cap, as you can see from the one lying down. And the top of the stem has a network, what we call a network of ridges, which is a little difficult to see in this photo, but more or less visible. This particular mushroom prefers coniferous forests. So, and this is a, a wonderful bolete. And um, uh, just, this happens to be the favorite bolete of the cow belonging to one of my mushroom collecting friends who has tried all the mushrooms on their cow. And this is the favorite one for the cow. Okay. Okay, another edible mushroom, you've heard of chanterelles. You can even buy chanterelles in the grocery store at certain times of the year. Um, chanterelles are really the uh, most important species for people who make a living by buy, uh, uh, collecting mushrooms and selling them commercially. You cannot grow this mushroom. You have to collect it in the wild. And we, we who, are, who care about conservation are worried that the resource is going to be depleted. So, you know, be careful, uh, t take only a reasonable amount. If you find a good place, don't tell everybody about it. That's all, I'm, that's my advice. Okay, so what's a chanterelle? So rather than gills under the cap, chanterelles have a series of raised ridges underneath the cap. The spores, as usual, are produced on these ridges. All right, this one, the top photograph is the golden chanterelle, Cantharellus californicus. This one grows under oaks. That's the one you're going to find if you're looking under oaks and you find something that looks like a chanterelle. The Pacific golden chanterelle. Uh, looks a lot like the golden chanterelle, uh, but it cantharelle, its name is Cantharellus formosus, and it grows under conifers. This one, the Pacific golden chanterelle, is the most important commercially collected chanterelle, at least in the Pacific Northwest. The white chanterelle, guess what? It's white, well, whitish, cream colored, really. Cantharellus subalbidus, and this grows mainly in coastal forests in California under Douglas fir, pine, madrone, and tan oak. So both conifers and broadleaf trees, you might find this mushroom. <clears throat> All right, I'd like to mention this, okay, the subject of microdosing. And the first thing I wanna say is do not do this at home. Do not microdose yourself. Okay, now, what is it? Microdosing is using a very small dose of some sort of psychoactive mushroom to help treat conditions such as depression or drug addiction. addiction. Um, this process should be implemented only under medical supervision, please. Um, but I'll tell you a little about it. In clinical trials, a microdose is a tiny portion of what would be a medical dose of a psychoactive mushroom. Then the microdose is taken every three days for about three months. This produces permanent changes in the brain of the patient, just as the use of some narcotics produces permanent change in the brain of the person taking them. The, the use of these mushrooms produces permanent changes in the brain of the patient. Uh, needless to say, not all patients can tolerate this regimen. Um, it, it has some value in that it might help people with their depression or drug addiction, but please do this under a doctor's supervision. Some uh, psychoactive mushrooms include the psilocybes, um, and as far as I know, in the entire United States, the possession of psilocybes is illegal. And you are facing two counts of possession of a controlled substance because there are two controlled substances in a psilocybe mushroom. Um, the lower photograph that you see is a psilocybe uh, cyanescens photo by Fred Stevens. Thank you, Fred. Um, the upper mushroom is Amanita muscaria, uh, which some of you may know was used by Siberian uh, early people in Siberia where the shaman ate the mushroom, uh, experienced the terrible effects, passed the active principle of the mushroom out in the urine and the acolytes used the urine to have the um, psychological effect of the mushroom without the poisoning. Seriously, okay. okay. On to the next slide. Next slide, okay. 
I, just to reinforce this, since I care about your safety and I care about your life, and I want you to be free to be in the forest foraging. I don't want you to be sitting in jail. Please, uh, possession of psilocybe is illegal, two controlled substances, therefore two counts. The compounds are hallucinogenic and have been responsible for um, hospitalizations of people who have used too much of this. Um, from my standpoint, the even worse problem is that people to get psilocybe mushrooms mixed up with the deadly poisonous gallerina mushroom. So here's a photograph of gallerina marginata. These small, these are small mushrooms, smaller is uh, smaller even than the psilocybes, and they are deadly poisonous. And so that I'm really frightened that people will pick some little brown mushroom, think that they would like to try it for its psychoactive properties and get a gallerina instead and kill themselves. Once again, you can't tell you've been poisoned until the material is thoroughly assimilated into your system. That's my story. So don't eat nothing. My advice for you novices, don't eat any wild mushroom unless identified by an expert, someone you really trust. And be aware of the possibility of an individual adverse or allergic reaction. Okay, what's the, wait a minute here, what's the mushroom on the left? Ammonita phalloides, the most dangerous mushroom in the world. The mushroom in the center, Ammonita muscaria, uh, toxic. And, and on the right, oh no, that's not psilocybe, that's the deadly poisonous gallerina. Okay. Here's, here's my part of the world. Jeremy showed you some of his part of the world. On the left, we have the Sacramento River in the autumn near the Bend area. Um, with, um, and then in the springtime, we have a blue oak savanna or forest and um, very beautiful wildflowers in this habitat. Once in a while, not much this year, but some years we actually get rain in our area, hence the rainbow. And thank you very much for listening to my uh, talk and I hope, wish you very wonderful foraging in the forest. Thank you. Thank you for that very informative uh, presentation. Um, it's really good to learn all the identifying features and, you know, what to be aware of so that we can make sure that everybody's safe out there. Um, I did want to, I did have a, actually a question about that death cap, um, the death cap mushroom. I've seen a lot of uh, information on the web. Um, I don't know how valid it is or what, but um, there's been suggestions on the web of milk thistle seeds being a possible remedy for poisoning from the death cap, since the milk thistle seeds have to do with um, repairing and restoring your liver. Uh, which I, 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 believe, yeah. I believe, no, I believe that uh, milk thistle is used in the treatment of poisoning for this mushroom. If you think you've been poisoned by this mushroom, please get to the emergency room immediately since it's killed more people than any other one. You know, we lost our um, one of our slides. Uh, I'm sorry, I may have ended my, I may have gotten my slide list. Nope, that's it. So some part of my, um, part of my presentation fell off, uh, so, uh, which is the online resources, which uh, I'll just tell you, since you saw me mention, I mentioned um, Myco Web. That's a wonderful online, free online resource for California and the Pacific Coast. And uh, Mushroom Observer, which is nat national, where people post their own pictures and discuss the, the identifications. All these things are free. So um, you make use of those. And the other thing that fell off was my, my books. Oh, can you see me? Hang on a second. I'll just show you a, a couple of books, all right, that I like. That slide disappeared. My favorites.
Guys, I want to thank Susan for my lifelong obsession with mushrooms. I met her in 2005 when she came to Whiskey Town. She had just moved here from Washington State and was wanting to get to know the local mushrooms. And they, they partnered her up with me as an employee to take her around and show mushrooms at, in the park, which I'd seen a lot of. And we found this awesome rare mushroom that only burned in in severely burned areas and it was about this big and it looked like a cow's stomach like a tripe <laughs> and she just got me so excited about this and about a week later I was in her mushroom class and I wanted to find a mor morel so bad and Redding's not known for morels they're just they're here, but it is not known for them. So I'm walking through the woods at work, chanting the Latin name under my breath, Marcella Esculenta, Marcella Esculenta. And I come around a bush and here's a giant morel mushroom. It was a magic moment. You had to be there. All right. Okay, here's a couple of books. Since we are uh, national Jeremy, presentation. Uh, would you mind turning off the uh, screen share and then we'd be able to see the, the books a little better okay. here. Okay. Am I on? There we are. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Uh, that's, it's hard to see that, but okay. This is Simon and Schuster's Guide to Mushrooms. Um, bring it back a little bit. Back, bring it back. Okay. Yeah, and I don't know if you can yeah. see that. Um, see this is a, a good book for the, the nation, US. Um, it, it was um, written and I believe and edited by Gary Linkoff and the New York Mycological Society, the late Gary Linkoff, unfortunately. And so this has mushrooms, I don't, I don't know, 400 species or something from the US. So this is good for um, if you want, if you're uh, collecting mushrooms uh, in uh, somewhere across the US. Okay, uh, locally or in California, oh, this is also national, all right? I can see right up here. Okay, this is Mushrooms Demystified by David Aurora. This happens to be Jeremy's favorite mushroom identification guide. Um, you need to learn a little bit about mushroom structures to use it, but it is comprehensive and, uh, and we, uh, it's very good. So we can recommend this book also. All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, two guides for California that I really like. Uh, this one is uh, Mushrooms of the Redwood Forest. And while it focuses on the mushrooms of the Redwood Forest, it, uh, the Redwood Coast, I beg your pardon, mushrooms of the Redwood Coast. And um, it works pretty well, even here in interior California. This is by Noah Siegel and Christian Schwartz. It has a lot of pictures. People really like pictures. Uh, I don't know, 400 maybe, uh, no, 700, 750 pictures. So this is a great guide for this area here. All righty. And um, another guide, California Mushrooms um, by uh, uh, Dennis Desjardins, uh, Michael Wood, the, one of the photographers whose pictures you saw, and Fred Stevens, another of the photographers. This is another wonderful book, great photographs, um, focused on California also. So thank you. Yeah, and Susan, we do have, um, yeah, we got a few more minutes here. So we got one question here coming in the chat. Um, Mikara is asking about um, how should your knife be cleaned between harvesting the different mushroom types? And um, do you think it's better mm -hmm. that people um, learn how to uh, learn about the toxic mushrooms outdoors while they're there? Or is it better to take, collect it, take it home and work on identifying it when you get back? Most people don't have time out when they're in the woods, especially in the, the autumn, let's say, when days are short, daylight is short. Um, you know, to be, take a modest number of mushrooms when you're collecting. It takes a lot of time to work on them later and, and identify them. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's one of the problems. People want to collect, let's say, for the table, and they um, they find something that they think is might be edible, and then they want to collect a bunch of them, and, uh, and they get home and find out they can't eat any of them. That's a big disappointment, and uh, it, uh, it depletes the resource. So, um, 
if you have a, a local mycological society, there are mycological societies for amateurs all over the country um, so that you can learn about these things. And then when you go out in the woods, you'll know what you're looking for and you'll be with local people who know where to go and what are good mushrooms to take. He had a question about his knife. He wanted oh, to I'm sorry, I forgot about the cleaning the knife. I have to admit, I guess I wiped the knife off on my jeans between picking one kind of mushroom and another, but um, that's an interesting question. I really hadn't thought about it. I mostly I wipe it off because of collecting soil while you're digging a mushroom. And we, we don't want to transfer soil from one place in the forest to another place in the forest. Um, you won't poison yourself if you, let's say you picked a mushroom, a poisonous mushroom with your knife. Um, there wouldn't be enough toxin to hurt you, even if you used it for another mushroom that you later ate. But I think it's probably a good idea to, you know, have a paper towel or a handkerchief in your bag and just wipe it off between collection spots. Yeah, well, thank you for that. That's uh, good to note there. Um, and I guess we have five more minutes. So um, I was actually curious um, about the microdosing. You were saying to the, um, to make sure you do it under medical supervision. And I was just wondering if there, if, um, where would that be um, something that somebody could reach out for like, um, oh. If it's actually legal for a medical supervision or um, is it, you know, regional or just wondering if you could speak about that a little more. I wish I could speak more about it. Um, you know, probably just about as much as I do about microdosing right now. It's it's a new, relatively new idea. And um, um, so, you know, I don't know where I would send you. I would have to look, uh, where would I send someone who uh, wanted to experiment with treating their problems in this way? I, I don't know where I would send you right now. Okay, sorry, I can't really answer that question. Kyle, I watched a recent program on Netflix. I can't remember the name of it, but it was mushrooms, microdosing. And the interesting thing was, that there was research on the properties of uh, the medicinal uses of mushrooms all the way up until mushrooms were classified as a drug along with pot, LSD, heroin. And then because it was considered a drug, the pharmaceutical industry stopped all their research. And I think that was in like the 1970s. And now they're talking about legalizing it and with the rise of the cannabis industries and alternative medicines, the pharmaceutical industry is putting their money back into research and funding. And whether you like the pharmaceutical industry or not, at least there's some money there for them to start generating some new studies and clinical trials and information. But yeah, I don't either know about how you'd become involved in that, you know. Yeah, I guess we're still on the, um the forefront of that kind of rebirth of those kind of substances and people being curious about, about them and wanting to learn more. And Susan, um, thank you again for your presentation. Um, I'm just wondering if um, anybody else has any more questions, go ahead and pop them into the chat. Um, we do have just a few more minutes here, um, um, but um, unless, I mean, people are in here um, oh, yes. recommending fantastic fungi. Was, did that have, was that maybe the um, one that you saw, Jeremy, or it's a different one there? Oh, I, I can't remember. I don't watch TV very much. So it was just kind of a random thing I saw. I saw a picture of a mushroom and I clicked it and I watched it. I never actually knew the name of it. I bet, okay. I bet it was fantastic fungi. That that's Probably, the one. That, yeah, yeah, that's the one that's that's yeah. circulating on Netflix. Yeah. Um, and Susan, before before uh, you get off, is there anywhere people can find you? Um, do you host any mushroom workshops or have any sort of uh, offerings you like to direct people to? Um, let's see. I don't know where we could direct people. Where uh, Jeremy and I were 
tentatively planning to do a, sort of a, a mushroom workshop sometime with through Shasta College uh, here in Reading. And so uh, keep an eye on Shasta College. Uh, keep an eye, uh, we would probably also advertise it through Shasta chapter of the California Native Plant Society. Um, we'd probably also advertise that event when we get that get it put together. Yeah. Yeah, so right now cool. it's in the idea stage. Most likely a fall event because that's when we're going to see some mushrooms. We don't want to have, have a mushroom no event when there are no mushrooms. No, so. it's very disappointing yeah. for everybody. For sure. And when there's no rain, we haven't had any rain. <laughs> okay all right so i'm putting in the chat shasta chapter through california native plant society and then people have um jeremy's website as well to uh be able to network so hopefully that'll be enough information if people are up in the north state and want to learn from y'all and um yeah it's just really exciting to have someone on who's been studying mushrooms for so long and has made such a contribution to the field so Thank you for that. That was very informative and very helpful to listen to. And um, we're just really grateful for y'all spending the time. Um, now I'm gonna try to make a breakout room here. Have, are y'all interested in hanging out for a few minutes to answer any lingering questions or are y'all wanting to go ahead and you know have, have your brunch or whatever? Is he talking to us? Yeah, I was talking to y'all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> Whatever you guys want to do. All right, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to make a breakout room for y'all. So if anyone wants to keep chatting and networking, um, let's do that. So, so it's gonna let participants choose respond? the room. This is this is a new technology for me, but uh, I'm gonna add a room. <laughs> let's see, and. You know what? It's a little bit, it's a little bit odd doing this stuff on the fly. So if y'all want to keep chatting, if y'all want to hang out, y'all could keep using the chat to talk back and forth the main chat, and that should be fine. We'll get this breakout room figured out. But if y'all want to hang on for you know five ten minutes, whatever you want to do, don't uh, you know, don't push it too far. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, just watch the chat. Yeah, yeah, great, and. All right, so we're going to move on to the next offering because we're at the that 130 mark. Um, thank you all so much again for being on. And I am going to change hosts. All right. So we're going to take a quick commercial break from one of our sponsors. Kyle, do you want to say anything about Maggie's offering and um, before we play her her commercial? Yeah, um, so one of our next uh, sponsors here is Maggie Brown, um, Maggie Brown Nutrition. And um, you could find her at maggiebrownnutrition.com. Um, you know, I've she, she does a lot of meal prep and working with people to figure out their, um, you know, their perfect diet. Um, and she does it kind of in like a, a holistic way um, where she, you know, not everybody has the same body type and the same, you know, lifestyle. So not everybody necessarily needs the same exact diet to support them to be happy and healthy and thriving. Um, and uh, yeah, she's also a friend of mine as well. And she's made acorn bread for um, my acorn classes and um yeah it's it's really delicious she's a great cook um she does a lot of seasonal type things too so like in the fall it's a lot of pumpkins and um you know winter squash that sort of stuff um great thanks for that intro and i'm going to play this commercial and also let me give a shout out to kyle before we go any further if y'all aren't already please follow kyle at reading forager on facebook and instagram he's a wealth of knowledge and like he was alluding to, he offers classes on all types of foraging content and also posts a lot of really creative and interesting content. So definitely follow him at Reading Forager. We were all born with these incredible bodies and this natural ability to not just repair and restore itself, but to adapt and thrive. We are perfectly designed to achieve not just homeostasis, 
but also a long, happy life. When you look back at hunter-gatherers throughout time and today still, it just seems they have it better, doesn't it? On some level, we all know that the diet and nutrition we see most common today isn't what we truly need. Processed foods, sugar, corn syrup, food in boxes just isn't how we were designed. Our roots, our genetic roots, ate from the earth. We ate in small windows when we had food, we lifted heavy things from time to time, we ran from predators once in a while, we played all the time, and we were always moving. But most of all, we were connected to the earth, to the seasons, to the area we were in, and we weren't alone. So what I'm here to tell you is that I want you to reconnect with your environment. I want you to eat what is smart. I want you to move and play as much as you can and to work out the way that feels right for you. I want you to push yourself from time to time. And when truly getting back to basics seems complicated to navigate, you don't have to do Go to my website and see how I'm helping so many of us get back to our roots. All right. So that was Maggie Brown. Y'all check out her content and her website. And next up, we have a really special musical guest. I'm really excited to introduce Samara Jade. Um, I'm going to bring her up. And yes, yeah, Samara, I actually met her at a beautiful event a couple of months back. We were at a tree planting party um, here in Western North Carolina. And Samara graced us with some amazing music around the fire after that tree planting event. And I was just blown away by her, her voice and her presence and just her ability to um, string together these amazing words and lyrics. And um, you guys will be hearing that in just a moment. So, I'm going to read her bio as she gets set up and everything. Just wondering if you can hear me. Oh, it sounds, sounds great. Okay, good. <laughs> great. I missed the previous workshop, which I was wanting to go to because I was troubleshoot troubleshooting some sound stuff. So I'm very glad that you can hear me. <laughs> We're glad you made it. All right. And let's see if we can see you. Yeah, there you go. Looking great in front of the fireplace all right so samara jade um she's a modern folk troubadour she's dedicated to the art of listening and deeply crafting soul-centered songs that are medicine for the moment she's inspired greatly by the wild wisdom of nature and the landscape of the human psyche her songs ride the crest of the unknown and balance between shadows and light Coming from a musical background as diverse as classical, jazz, folk, Broadway music, and progressive rock, some a unique tapestry of sounds with a quality of musicianship distinctly her own, as heart opening as they are intellect stimulating. A fan once coined the term philosophical to describe Samara's tunes, and no one has ever described it better in that one word nutshell. Samara dwells in her van, Vincent Van Gogh, and is committed to sharing her song beings around like thousands of spiraling maple helicopter seeds, which is not coincidentally what a Samara is. All right, and you guys can visit samarajademusic.com to learn about her workshops and listen to more of her music and for upcoming concerts. And without further ado, Samara, I'm gonna hand it over to you. And uh, yeah, let's, um, let's all listen in. Thanks so much, Brian. I appreciate that intro and for you inviting me here. This is a wonderful thing. Um, to get to share music on. So I'm just going to play a bunch of songs inspired by nature and trees and mushrooms. And I don't know, we'll see what else emerges. Deep in the woods, I saw them dancing, the elegant tops of the tall cedar trees. Swayed back and forth, gently romancing The tides, the skies, they long to be kissed by the breeze and Early in the morning, I heard them singing The wren and the robin were raising the sun Out of the shadows, the tune started ringing To remind all the rest of us the day had begun Singing the song of the wild The rising, the falling, the death and the birth I wanna play like a child Wake 
Awake from my sleep to the dream of the earth. Late in the night, I heard coyotes howling, wailing their praises to the colors above. The moon, she is wise and gently corralling the tides of our time to rise up in love. Singing the song of the wild The rising and fall Then the death and the birth I wanna play like a child Wake from my sleep To the dream of the earth Dream of the earth It's wobbled and warped, but this wheel is still turning. Pushing me forth on the path to be whole. Oh, but how to go forth when it seems we stop caring for all of the gifts that keep us alive? We've lost our true north. Can we regain our bearings and try to be rewild so all beings can thrive and sing the song of the wild? The rising and fall, then the death and the birth. I wanna play like a child and wake from my sleep to the dream of the earth. Dream of the earth. Dream of the earth. I It's always strange to me that I haven't really done a whole lot of live streaming and playing to the, the virtual reality. It's kind of, I've skipped over that in the pandemic um, for the most part. So I trust that you all are out there listening. I can see some of your faces. Yay. Um, Getting lots of messages from people saying they, they <laughs> love your music. So, so sweet. people are hearing it. Sounds oh, great. I appreciate it. it. It means a lot to, um, yeah, to get to share music at uh, events uh, that are really aligned with with things I'm passionate about. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, and, and like Brian said, we met at a tree planting party. So I've I've got lots of songs about trees. So I'll keep rolling in, in that theme. Um, and as he mentioned in, in my bio, what a Samara is for those of you who missed it um, or who don't know, a Samara is a name of a seed pod that. Um, several trees have, such as maple trees, most well-known. Um, botanically speaking, a Samara is a winged nut, you know, those helicopter seeds that spiral all around. So I'm going to play the, the winged nut song. That's what this next one is called, about my name. Cause you wanna know who am I I'm a wild gesticulating Gemini I talk with my hands and I feast with my eyes I look with my ears and I listen with my cries Look with my ears and I listen with my cries I'm a beautiful mess but I clean up nice One part sugar and three parts spice I've given up on reason, so I roll the dice. When they land, I don't look twice. When they land, I don't look twice. Cause I'm just me. A helicopter seed upon the breeze. A winged nut just trying to be free. Until I land and grow into a tree. into the mystery Oh, I'm from the mountains and from the sea From a river of pain inside of me From the 
dark from the light, from the heat, from the she, from the paradox of duality. The paradox of duality. And I got two sides and I got two wings. When they're in balance, keeps me spiraling. And I always was a searching for that long lost twin. Had to break to know I was whole with him. Had to break to know I was whole with him. It's not just me and the cop to seat upon the breeze. Oh, I get not just trying to be free until I land and grow into a tree. Well, my life is green, but I get the blues. The world's going off, and I still hit snooze. But I'm trying to wake up so I can choose to find the breadcrumbs and follow the clues. Find the breadcrumbs and follow the clues. And I'm not afraid of being alone. Wherever my heart's beating is where I call home. And I trip up that when I cross to the great unknown. God pinches my cheeks and says, My, how you've grown. God pinches my cheeks and says, My, how you've grown. God pinches my cheeks and says, My, how you've grown cause I'm just me a helicopter seat upon the breeze a winged nut just trying to be free until I land and grow into a tree that branches out into the mystery Thank you, that's the Winged Nut song. If folks are digging the tunes, you can listen to them at all the places where you listen to music. You know, the Spotify, the Bandcamp. We're right here, right now. I'm gonna keep rolling on the, the tree theme. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm currently in North Carolina, but I've spent most of the last four years living in Washington, um, Washington State. So a lot of my songs have cedar trees in them. Um, I've also spent a good bit of time in Northern California, so redwood trees too have been great teachers. And yeah, I'll sing the song that was given to me by a great-grandmother cedar tree in Washington along the Skokomish River on the Olympic Peninsula. Laying back in the big lap, Grandmother Cedar. Gonna lay back in the sturdy lap of this old cedar. Great grandmother, gonna lay back in the sturdy lap of great, great grandmother. Gonna lay back in the sturdy lap of this old cedar. Great grandmother gonna lay back in the sturdy lap of great, great, great grandmother gonna teach me how to breathe, gonna teach me how to breathe, gonna teach me how to breathe steady when the world's going crazy all around. Grandmother, won't you teach me how to be, won't you teach me how to be, won't you teach me? How to be strong and rise up rooted in the ground, yeah. Rise up rooted in the ground. I'm gonna lay back in the sturdy lap of this old stone, ancient bone. Gonna lay back in the sturdy lap of great great grandfather. I'm gonna lay back in the sturdy lap of this old stone, ancient I'm gonna lay back in the sturdy lap of great, great, great grandfather. Gonna teach me how to breathe. Gonna teach me how to breathe. Gonna teach.
touch me how to breathe steady when the world's going crazy all around grandfather won't you teach me how to be won't you teach me how to be won't you teach me how to be strong rise up rooted in the ground yeah rise up rooted in the ground i'm gonna lay back in the sturdy lap Great spirit, oh great spirit, gonna lay back in the sturdy lap of great, great, great spirit. I'm gonna lay back in the sturdy lap of great spirit, oh great spirit, gonna lay back in the sturdy lap of great, 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 great spirit, gonna teach me how to love, gonna teach me how to love gonna teach me how to love steady when the world's going crazy all around great spirit won't you teach me how to trust won't you teach me how to trust won't you teach me how to be strong rise up rooted in the ground yeah rise up rooted in the ground yeah rise up rooted in the ground sturdy lap of this old cedar great grandmother gonna lay back in the sturdy lap of great great grandmother thank you all right well i'm reminded from that one to yet another tree song, tree and and um, mushroom song. Just yeah, thinking about the mycelial web of interconnection. I wrote this when I was living in Arcata, California, actually right at the start of the pandemic. And um, to help keep me sane, I walked every day in the redwood forest and. Um, Simultaneously, I was reading this wonderful book, which I'm sure some of y'all have read, um, called The Overstory. Fantastic novel, which I highly recommend, but it's, it's all about old growth trees and just the interconnection of, of everything. Um, so I was thinking a lot about that and, and roots and um, mushrooms. So this song came out of that. I trust my roots. Connect us as one, connect us as one, connect 
us as one. I trust my roots to connect us as one. Go down, down into the earth. Going down, down into the earth. Intertwining with our beings, I'm seeing in every direction. Going down, down into the earth. I'll send a message on the world wide web of interconnection. You know I'm gonna trust my roots. All right. Beautiful, Samara. Thank you. And can you play us out one more, perhaps? For sure. And before you do that, maybe um, you have a songwriting or vocal workshop coming up tomorrow. Would you like to give a link that people could perhaps sure. find that? Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. I'm sure. Uh, yeah, happy to put a link to that in the chat after I'm done playing. Um, doing a little virtual songwriting workshop tomorrow, um, five o'clock Eastern Standard Time, just an hour and a half long, kind of bite sized workshop on how to write your own affirmation songs, kind of mantra songs, um, right in time for the new moon coming up a few days later. So that yeah, sounds excellent. Are, interested please check it out um it's yeah it's a sliding scale price and just an hour and a half and it'll be it's open for all levels of musicality and songwriting and yeah it'll be sweet so, cool look forward to that so we'll look for that link in the chat after you get awesome. done thank you yeah thanks so much again for uh for asking me on to share music on here um, our pleasure Looking forward to checking out some of the workshops after this. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, well, maybe I'll leave you with um, a song about fermentation. I guess if there's foragers out there, I imagine that there's at least a few people who like to dabble in the realms of fermentation. Um, it's a big passion and hobby of mine. It has been for a long time. And um, I kind of inadvertently created a religion called the Church of Fermentation when I wrote this song. So hopefully I can inoculate some of you if you haven't already been inoculated into the Church of Fermentation. There's a nook in my apartment where I keep a holy shrine with crystal shells and Buddhas Things that remind my heart to shine And the space around stays empty Cause there's sacredness in space To meditate on emptiness is to be Arm in arm with grace But meanwhile in my kitchen Many foods ferment It's starting to get cluttered And look like a science experiment but the space around my shrine is just reserved for all things holy Until the moment that I realize fermentation can be part of my spirituality From the fungi to the yeast to the bacteria so divine After all you are those holy ones turn water into wine We must honor those life processes that lead to transformation And bow down in the church of fermentation in all the ancient cultures, fermentation was the key. Preservation with no refrigeration. Of course, it had to come to be. Perhaps it started as an accident, a food project gone wrong. But what a joy he must have had that fellow who let his grape juice sit too long. From the fungi to the yeast, to the bacteria so divine. After all, you are those holy ones, turn water into wine. We must honor those life processes that lead to transformation and bow down in the church of fermentation. There are so many ferments, don't you know? There's kombucha, yogurt, sourdough, and I can never do without kimchi and sauerkraut. With no cheese or sour cream, we can never please our taco dream. Tofu miso and tamari, Japanese food would be so sorry. So many of these we totally need, like wine and beer and cider and mead. Oh, how 
bleak this life would be without chocolate tea and coffee. So if there are things that no longer serve you, you can let them decompose. Or you can put them in a bottle and watch as they turn around and grow into something far superior and digestible in the end. Let's give thanks to the microorganisms for making their brilliant amends. From the fungi to the yeast, to the bacteria so divine, after all you are those holy ones, turn water into wine. We must honor those life processes that lead to transformation and bow down in the church of fermentation. And bow down in the church of fermentation one more time. And bow down in the church of fermentation. That cheers. was excellent. Yes, cheers. <laughs> drinking um, water i wish i had a fermented beverage <laughs> oh that'd be wonderful um thank you so much samara and some people were were suggesting they wanted to unmute to give you a round of applause so anyone who wants to do that i'm going to give you the option to unmute yourself That's super sweet <laughs> for just a moment so you can give samara a round of applause <laughs> yeah <Yay. laughs> that was really yeah, great wonderful. All right. Wow. Now, if everyone who unmuted themselves would very kindly <laughs> mute themselves back, we have 92 people on the call. So, wow. um, oh, 92 people. <laughs> yeah, we would like to make sure it stays, you know, quiet so we can hear everybody. Um, but yeah, if you would mute yourself back if you unmuted yourself for that clap. But thank you so much, Samar. That was really beautiful. Um, and once again, go ahead and drop in the chat that songwriting workshop so that people can uh, participate in that if they want to tomorrow. And um, I put your music link in there already for your website, but feel free to drop in the chat any sort of Instagram, Facebook, anything you want people to um, to be able to access you on. And up next, everybody, we got Clay Bowers. Really excited to hear his presentation and talk with him a bit. Um, I'm going to do a quick check in though, before we move forward, it seemed like a lot of people, I was getting some emails and doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes while things are going on. And a lot of people are emailing me saying they're having trouble logging on. If anybody wanted to chat in and say, um, let me know if you were having trouble logging on and how you were able to fix it. We could chat about that a little bit in the chat. Cause I'm just curious what, what's going on, but I just read a bunch of, uh, I've resent the links to a bunch of people. So hopefully everyone is able to get on and, um, and access the summit, but it seems like a lot of, you know, everyone who's on here figured it out. So kudos to you for that. And good. It looks like the zoom link finally came through. Some people are saying the, the event bright email and link does not work. And I think it might be that some people just aren't seeing it. Cool. We'll keep things rolling. I'll chat with y'all during it, during Clay's um, talk so that we can maybe get that figured out. But enjoy yourselves. Don't worry. Everyone who's here that needs to be is here right now and more people are coming. Um, thank you to all the people who have who have shared their amazing talents and gifts with us so far. Really grateful for all our presenters and performers. And um, yeah, just super to be doing this so yeah up next we have clay bowers and clay you should be able to um unmute yourself or i can ask you to unmute there we go okay and um, i'm gonna i'll do a brief intro for you and then i'll give you the floor okay all right <laughs> so really excited to have clay on clay's a super experienced forager and um we're definitely uh just really grateful to have him clay is a foraging instructor natural navigator and a self-proclaimed plant nerd living in northern michigan learning about his plant and fungal neighbors has been a passion of his since childhood and has been a true obsession for about a decade now 
He believes the way of wild crafting will change how we look at the world. He leads foraging, tracking, and wild tending classes in northern Michigan and other parts of the eastern U.S. Check out offerings, workshops, and blog at nomiforager.com, and I'll paste that into the chat um, so you guys can all network with Clay. And uh, without further ado, Clay, you can take it away, man. Thank you. I really got to update that because uh, you said 10 years and I can't remember how long ago I wrote that, but it's <laughs> much longer than 10 now. Right um, on. So first of all, I'm going to apologize. Uh, Brian knows I'm not very good at Zoom. I have, I'm very technologically impaired. So um, I apologize if I, in advance to everybody, I don't know how to do these things very good. Um, so I'm going to try to do the share screen I have come up with. I made a little uh, Prezi presentation on wild tending. It's a huge passion of mine. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Can you see that? I can see it, yeah. All right. All well, right. Uh, so hold on one second, everybody. Uh, all right. This, this is uh, a very big passion of mine. And, and uh, I always say in all my foraging classes that foraging is not just about taking. It's also about giving back. So here's the wild tending ba basics. The first thing I like to tell people is that trees are like people. Just like humans, trees need space to thrive and create future generations. The most productive sugar bushes and nut orchards have ample sunlight hitting the ground around these trees. So I don't know if uh, people have noticed this, but if you go into the deep forest, you rarely ever find a, a nut tree that produces a good ample uh, crop of acorns or hickory nuts. It's usually the trees that are in park settings that where we all forage are nut crops from. And the same can be said for your sugar bush. Um, we make maple sugar here every year and the best producing trees are the ones that have ample sunlight hitting them. So I have right here this uh, this other picture. This is a picture of a dense forest and it's and I got written there thriving only for the logging industry. And that's because this is a barren landscape that does not do a lot of good for us um, except for the one species there are, it does a lot of good for humans economically, but it doesn't do good for us, uh, eat, uh, environmentally. So, um, and then this is a picture right here. Um, unfortunately I made this presentation. You can't read what it says, but it says thriving for plants, animals, and ourselves. So this, this is a, this is a picture of an oak. I believe this is a, uh, Quercus, um, it, it's a coast live oak in California. So that's a, that's a picture I was able to find online of a huge coast live oak. These things are able to produce up to a thousand pounds of acorns in a season. So that's pretty amazing. Um, and then trees that are thin can be used for a variety of sustainable products and the understories of these thin forests can be managed to grow other edibles. So basically the picture that I have in the background of this presenta presentation is a picture of what a healthy ecosystem looks like that's good for both humans, animals, and plants. Um, and like I said, the trees that can be thinned can be used for things. So one example is sometimes for some of my clients, I will go and actually help them manage sugar bushes by cutting out the little tiny maple saplings that are basically invasive in those forests which clears space to make the sugar maples produce more sap. And then what we do is we cut the sugar maples into productive sizes for mushroom logs. So then you get a dual harvest. You get the shiitakes or oysters or lion's mane that you can grow on the sugar maple. And then you also get enhanced sap production in those forests. And then as it says here, you can also manage the understory. So a lot of where I live, the um, beached maple forests are chock full of the uh, wild leeks. And you can actually enhance the growth of wild leeks. So I'm going to keep going a little bit. 
Does anybody have any questions about those before I go on? Is there anything I should know before I go on, Brian? Um, you're looking good. You sound good. And um, we will have questions kind of towards the end, but people can go to chat in with some questions as we go along to me and Kyle will take care of and relay them to you. But uh, sounding great. Okay, sounds good. All right, we're going to go to the next step. So uh, paradoxical. Um, the entire concept of wild tending is paradoxical. With the fundamental way in which we see wilderness needs to be adjusted in order for us to once again have healthy soils, forests, and creatures that live on these lands. Sometimes taking is giving, but it is important that we learn the appropriate type of taking in order to maximize our good relationship with the earth on which we live. Uh, this picture over here to the right, this is a beaver dam. Now a beaver dam is it, my model always for the wild tender. He, he or she is the animal that takes and takes and takes, but the end result is something that is amazing. And for the future generations of so many different species, it's good. It's good not only for the beaver, it's actually good for the trees, which is paradoxical. And then it's good for uh, fish. You can establish wild rice in beaver ponds. Ducks love be beaver ponds. They're an amazing place. Plus they slow down the spread of water throughout the landscape, which irrigates everything around it. So um, they are my hero as far as like a, like a mascot for, for wild tending. Now, and I also say that the concept of uh, wild tending is paradoxical for us because we have grown up in a society that tells us to treat nature as essentially like a museum that we need to walk through and not touch. And what that has resulted in is unhealthy soils, unhealthy lands, unhealthy places. We have really good qualities that we can impart on the land. But like I said here at the bottom, uh, we have to know how to do those things. You can't just go out and rampantly take everything you want and not expect there to be consequences. You have to know what time to take things, how much to take. So for instance, my uh, favorite example is up here where we live. And I know that I've heard um, other people say in different parts of the countries that this is different, but where we live, if we leave our wild leeks uh, to a minimum of five per square foot, um, we, we always have growth and it actually seems like the wild leeks grow and expand throughout the forest much more and our, and our forests have more wild leeks and that's with the harvest of the bulbs and everything but like I said we take and we leave five per square foot so if we come to a patch we don't clear the whole patch and if we come to a little clump of wild leeks we'll always leave at least five and that's because they spread by seed but they also spread by division like every onion species, so they can um, they can really uh, take over the forest. We had a, a forest last year by us that expanded probably an acre in the last year with more wild leeks. So I'm going to go to the next step. Planting wild edibles. Planting is just as important as taking away. If you are to make your landscape more forager friendly, Many plants that were historically abundant on our lands have been replaced by invasive species. It is possible to use invasives as allies in your quest to reestablish native species. Indigenous peoples the world over have used nurse plants to raise up new generations of fruit or nut trees. Farming is checkers, wild tending is chests. There is much more strategy involved. This right here is a blueberry rake and we use blueberry rakes to pick autumn olives. Autumn olives are an invasive species all over this, con this country, probably the world. They put nitrogen into the soil. So when I said that we can use inv invasive species to help our native species, what I meant was we use them as a nurse plant. So because they put nitrogen into the soil, they increase the rate of growth of the plants around them. It's especially when you cut them. So a strategy that we have evolved here is planting trees right next to the base of an autumn olive, cut the autumn olive down, and although that autumn olive will re-sprout, 
what ends up happening is it dumps all the nitrogen into the soil. The little seedling will grow up and it'll grow at a much faster rate than it normally would because of all the extra nitrogen. And then what ends up happening is if you plant a tree that then can shade out that autumn olive, they don't do as good in shade. So if you have an autumn olive thicket that is um, taking over your woods, the uh, best thing to do, or not woods, uh, a field, the best thing to do would actually to plant a forest around it because autumn olives will survive in the shade, but they almost never make any, any sort of uh, berries like you see here in this picture. And then also just utilizing what we have available is, is excellent. You know, we have, uh, I, I have a question, Brian, can people see where I'm using my mouse? Um, I don't think we, I don't think we can see your mouse. Well, actually, yeah, we can see your mouse movements, Clay. Cool. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Use it as a pointer for sure. Yeah, yeah. All right, good. So, um, where, um, my point was, so this, these autumn olives were growing out in the field and, um, they look like this here where I live. We have crazy, crazy, like we probably have the best autumn olive picking in the country that I've ever seen and oftentimes into December, but uh, only in the sunny areas. In the shaded areas, you may see occasionally single autumn olives like this. And so that's why I say it's important that we shade these things out if we're going to work with them. And this over time will um, help these things become not, uh, not eradicated, but it'll help them adjust to living here in, in this country and then other uh, pathogens and insects will learn how to eat them and they won't become such a nuisance in the next uh, 100 or 200 years I think and and what we do as humans is we we learn how to take these take these plants that are a nuisance on our landscape and eventually kind of naturalize them and that's in my mind the best thing that we can do um, now, I did want us to talk about planting, um, planting uh, wild edibles. There's lots and lots of, at, at the end of this, I don't want to like go switch from screen to screen, but I collect nuts and fruit seeds from wild areas all over my, when I travel all over and I put them in Ziploc bags in the fridge and I fill those with dirt and I moisten them a little bit and then I keep them in the fridge all winter and then when spring rolls around we take those out and we plant them all the nuts out into different little seed trays and what ends up happening is we have a ton of new edible plants that we can put on the landscape and these are things that are easy to just heal in that's the old word so if anybody has ever been to like northern wisconsin you'll see there's hazelnuts absolutely everywhere. Now what happened was during the days of the, the CCC, the, um, during the depression, they had troops of people healing in hazelnuts. And as a result, Northern Wisconsin is actually absolutely like overgrown with hazelnuts. I've never seen so many hazelnuts in an area in all my life, but the hazelnuts are excellent food for all of the other animals and ourselves. So what you end up with is this amazing habitat for turkey and grouse and, and bear. And so planting is part of foraging, in my opinion. And then the other part that I was going to say about planting is that a lot of, a lot of times we get this idea that foraging, and, and I, I used to be stuck on this, this kind of feeling too, that uh, it's not wild if we plant it. But I, I've come to think over the last four or five years that that's kind of a ridiculous thing to think. You know, we humans are natural to the environment. We can do things that are good. And if we were once wild, then th the things that we planted are wild as well. So um, native people all over the Great Lakes area actually used to expand wild rice beds, take them and plant them in different areas. And that increases the wild rice for the humans, but it also increases habitat for ducks. It also increases hiding places for fish. It's it's wonderful. It's a great way that we can do things is uh, help help uh, by planting things instead of just 
foraging because that's not a good strategy if you want to have a lot of uh, a lot of plants on your landscape. Okay, beneficial for all. Farming involves the demise of many species for the betterment of one. Wild tending involves the intentional disruption of the landscape in a matter that is better for all species that utilize it. Europeans were utterly amazed at what an East Coast forest looked like upon their arrival in these lands. Plant foods were incredibly abundant and also wild game. It is my thought that living more closely intertwined with our earth not only helps our physical health, but our mental health as well. Um, so this is real basic, like all around the world where people were living closer to the earth, they developed these ways to tend to the wild, to make them, uh, the wild spaces more abundant. And this was uh, widely practiced in Australia. This was widely practiced in Europe, actually, before agriculture. And the most important examples that we have are the examples of what happened in North America, because we saw those the last. So in North America, we had the wide use of fire. It, it was written that fire was, was taken, and uh, there'd be smoke on the horizon half, half of the summer. Almost every summer, people would see smoke on the horizon from all the burning that was done by the native people here. But that burning made the wildlife extraordinarily abundant, both on the East Coast and the West Coast. And what I mentioned here is people came here, Europeans, and they, they often remarked that you could drive a wagon through the forest because it was so open. And we know now that um, before 1904, when the Chinese, the uh, Asian, uh, the chestnut blight came in and wiped out all of our chestnut, that one in four trees along the East Coast from Maine to Northern Florida was an American chestnut tree. Now that can't have been an accident because chestnut trees just wouldn't have been spread that easily except for by human means, in my opinion. I could be wrong about that. But uh, chestnuts are an amazing source of food for not only humans, but also for, again, every other species. Now, if you're burning and taking the, uh, the understory and you're, you're thinning it out, you're going to make those trees produce much better. And then there's going to be a lot more space and a lot more food for animals. It's going to be an amazing landscape. And that's exactly what we found. We had um, Europeans sailing up and down the East Coast for weeks at a time, not able to find any place that wasn't extremely populated. And in my talk about mental health here, um, you had a lot of people who were very healthy. So that when Europeans did come here and they had their farming culture, they often ran away. They ran away to live with the natives so much so that they, the pilgrims and other Europeans made laws that you were to be put in jail if you got caught after running away. So this is an amazing thing for all of us. Um, I know that I'm much happier the more time I get to spend outside, even if it's cold or wet or rainy. It's amazing for us. Here's a picture I included to show our smiley faces. This is me and my, my ricing partner, Gil. I harvest rice with him every year. And um, we take rice every single year and we Put it, or uh, I come back here and, and I've been planting it around my area for years now to try to ex extend it. Um, now, I know that there was one thing I wanted to say about this right here that I, that I skipped over. Um, so in, in thinning, in thinning the forest, uh, what, what we also have to deal with is there's tons of animals that also plant trees. So a blue jay, or, or jays in general, they uh, have formed these relationships where they evolved with oak trees. So one jay on an average year plants roughly 4,600 oak trees. And they say that they're so terrible at remembering where they are that the average jay leaves like 3,300 um, oak trees to sprout. And uh, what ends up happening is you have these forests that just get actually absolutely inundated with oak trees. Oak wood is very good for humans and it's also very good for mushrooms. So we do things like utilize uh, the blue jay burying the oaks, the squirrels, they make trees. 
So uh, taking these trees down is is like a paradoxical thing because we're we're taking we're taking them and we can use them for many things other than just leaving them to crowd out the forest. And uh, anyway, my pr presentation is small, but now I want to go back to the regular screen. So I'm gonna stop that. Um, can you see me now, my face? Yep. Okay. Okay, so that that's the presentation, but then I wanted to show you guys, this is a bag. Um, and I fill these I fill these up with with dirt and I have I have these giant hazelnuts in here. Um, I spend a lot of time uh, finding the biggest and best hazelnuts that I can on the landscape and encouraging those rather than the rather than the small hazelnuts that tend to grow up here. So we have uh, Corliss americana here, which is very, very small. So any any nuts that I find that are tiny or that are that are bigger than average, I like to spread those genetics around. Um, the same goes for hickories, and the same goes for wild plums. Um, so I have a lot of that stuff, and then and then pawpaws as well. I, I put all of those things: hickory nuts, pawpaws, acorns. I plant all of those out. And I actively manage um, some people's lands to make them more forageable, at least here in the area I've been hired to do so. And what we've seen is a lot of times increase in food. So um, one of the, uh, speaking to the paradox, um, there's a lot of things that you can harvest, like I mentioned, the wild leeks, but also we can harvest cattails um, and Cattail shoots. Um, one thing that that is uh, that is uh, uh, are not apparent to a lot of people is that there are two species of cattails growing all over North America. There's Typhus latifolia, which is our native species, and then there's Typhus angustifolia, which is non-native. So we can harvest the crap out of Typhus angustifolia, and also again with the paradox, we can harvest Typhus latifolia. And we can make that uh, actually spread. It seems like every year when I harvest cattail shoots, that those places are more abundant the following year. So, anyway, um, I am totally open to answering questions, anything like that. I know that that was probably shorter. I'm also fully admitting here that I have like uh, <laughs> never done a speech on this thing, so I didn't know how long it was going to be. <laughs> That was excellent, man. And I like the the last point you brought up about, you know, knowing the different species types, like knowing that there are two types of cattails and there could be a native and invasive species in the same place sometimes. Um, and I was going to mention that in one of the talks earlier as well, is that, you know, people don't realize that there's, you know, native thistles and native dandelions to certain places. And um, it's kind of important to know the the local species to be able to um, differentiate those things and not just think, well, this is the invasive thistle or, you know, the invasive cattail and, and to kind of know, but I, I love your point that no matter what, you know, we can be increasing the diversity and be increasing the abundance of those native species while also managing the invasives, not with the, you know, sort of notion that we're going to necessarily eradicate them, if that's even possible to do, um, but to manage them for diversity. And that's what it always comes back to for me anyway. Um, but yeah, we got plenty of questions. So is it okay if I just rattle some questions to you from the audience? Absolutely. Great. All right. So Linda asked, she said, most often she sees social media posts on numbers or pounds plundered from the wild. How can we create the expectation that posts include some, if not equivalent, removed non-native invasives or trash? And that's a pretty big question, but I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Um, so it's not as glamorous to harvest uh, invasive species in most people's opinion. Um, 
I, I'm with you there. Like I, I actually do try to pull out and, and every invasive that I can. And um, oftentimes what I'll do is I like, I, for instance, um, a lot of people have buckthorn, which is a horrible invasive in wetland areas. And what I'll do is I, I actually take a knife or an ax with me everywhere. And if I see it, I just girdle every one I see. I, I, I cut the bark and a ring around the tree and I just kill them. And I move on with my day and that's the way we can give back. Um, unfortunately, to your point though, like uh, uh, it's not it's not like going to be like a glamorous thing that you're going to post pictures of on Instagram and get a ton of likes. But people uh, do get tons of likes for other things. So I think how we can change it would be to maybe make it more like uh, acceptable to show those kinds of things. But but then you do come up with the problem that there's a lot of people who are underinformed. If I showed a picture of a bunch of girdled, um, uh, you know, like buckthorn plants, you'd get these people chiming in telling me how I'm destroying nature. So it's it's a it's a it's a hard thing to do. Yeah. Certainly, certainly. Well, thanks for thanks for addressing that. Um, yeah, it's it's something. And I, I was thinking about this yesterday as I was just like roaming around my landscape and through flora rose and um it's an ugly process you know it's it's tangly nasty stuff and um just trying to do it from a place of like i love the forest so much and i love these other species so much that i have to do this it's not it's easy to kind of get in this space of like almost being angry at the multiflora rose for being there um but i think it's important to keep in check on that so thanks for answering that um let's see next question um, Cheryl's asking if you want to use for them, or she's saying all autumn olive berries can be turned into delicious fruit leather. Mm -hmm. Um, that wasn't really a question, but all yeah, right. we, we make, uh, we make a lot of stuff with autumn olives. Um, because like I said, um, so the native habitat of, of autumn olives, Eliagnus umbellata is, is from a dry sandy soil. And Northern Michigan is about the sandiest place you can find in the country. So we have so much production here that I'm, I'm not kidding you. We've harvested in, in years past, like a hundred or more pounds of berries and, and never had, uh, and still there's probably thousands and thousands of berries that we could have picked. Um, so yes, uh, we make mead and jam and we do fruit leathers. <laughs> it, it's crazy. Yeah, autumn, autumn olive can be so good, too, when it's handled properly. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing those recipes and ideas. Um, all right, Jen's asking, how do we distinguish domesticated from foraged if we actively plant? No, that's pretty, pretty broad question, but any thoughts on that? Yes, I do have, I do have thought on that. Um, I'm going to steal this from my friend Sam Thayer domestication is a process that actually changes the genetics of the plant or the or the species that's genetic uh, that's that's uh, domesticated so in in all reality like we we look and we see an orchard full of apples those are not truly domesticated those are clones of one another but apples have never been genetically domesticated so um a domesticated species is, is an altered thing that couldn't survive in the landscape basically on its own, right? Like how many people have ever seen um, corn growing in a field multiple years after the field has been cut? You, you don't because it can't survive without our, without our planting it. Now, apple trees spread easily all over the landscape. That's because they've never been domesticated and they're so heterozygous that they can adapt to many different climates and places. Excellent. Yeah. Hopefully some people um, got that. That's, that's definitely a broad question. Thank you for the succinct answer on that. There's a, there's a book called tamed that everybody should read. What's it called? A book about tamed. Tamed. Okay, great. And I, I can't remember the name of the author, but she's a great author. And the book has, uh, I think, 10 different species that have been domesticated by humans. Okay, so that book's called Tamed, if anybody out there wants to check it out. That sounds excellent. Um, and I'll read through a couple more of these questions. Just a moment. 
Yeah, lots of great comments coming in. Um, so Makara was saying, since most landscapes had native indigenous peoples at some point, everything wild now could have previously been planted or spread. So how would we know for sure anyhow? And I think you were touching on this a bit with the, the chestnuts of North America. She says, it seems like a transferred wild plant seed spore from one area to another is same as walking through an area and dispersing. Not the same as taking sunflower seeds out to the woods and planting them. Um, so the question being, we how do we know basically like if we see things from the past, do we look at these things? How do we know? Yeah, um, sort of like how would we know if things have been previously planted or spread? So I guess it's kind of going back to that same point about domesticated versus versus wild and some of the subtlety in between those distinctions. Well, there's lots of there's lots of species that are all over North America that are in in very like different places like. Pecan is a very intriguing one. We know that pecan comes from Texas. That's the, the origin place of pecan is Texas and, and Northern Mexico there. And that was when the time of uh, Europeans got here, we had all of the Mississippi covered in pecan trees and we had pecan trees all the way over in the Carolinas. Um, obviously like, like anybody who's picked pecans can realize the value immediately if you're into eating nuts. I mean, uh, a relatively easy shell to break, high in fat. If you're in a landscape that uh, you need fat to, to survive, you're gonna obviously take those nuts and plant them in your, in your home landscape. And then we also know with how much people were traveling all over the country that there was lots of trade and lots of, lots of changing of, of places. For instance, um, we, have, we have in um, Isle Royale in, in, the, in Lake Superior, it's part of Michigan, but it should really be Canada. Um, there are species there that only exist there and then in Alaska. And I don't even know how that would have happened besides with humans, because that's the only thing that makes sense. Um, and then we also have in the upper peninsula of Michigan, we have pockets of hickory trees randomly growing and there's no hickory trees around any of the other surrounding counties. So how did those things get there? You know, it, human, humans take things. That's what we do. We always take things to new landscapes. That's a fascinating point right there, finding those little pockets that are somewhat inland of those certain <laughs> plant populations. Because I've asked this question a lot, and I'll cover this in my presentation a bit, but um, just the idea of how certain plants are native to places like, you know, you can have stinging nettle that's native to the West Coast and is also native to Europe at the same time. I don't necessarily yeah. think humans move those around, but there's like that, also that, that concept of the supercontinent of Pangaea where all these things are originated basically. And um, yeah, it's just, but with those little pockets that are inland, it's like, that was obviously probably humans moving those things around because animals are going to be, um, you know, it could be animals to some degree, but um it seems like it's it's more so more likely to be humans because animals are pooping so quickly anyway it's not like they're necessarily getting those things um you know in those really specific places near the human settlement so that's fascinating mm -hmm. and someone else was asking um are there any other books that you recommend for those who wish to learn more about foraging or wild tending oh geez uh, everybody should read all of sam thayer's books <laughs> that's uh those are like the, the books I think everybody should have automatically in their foraging uh, books. And yes, oh yeah, you, uh, yeah. And then um, the, uh, as far as wild tending, I don't, I don't think there's actually a lot of information out there. There's some, there's the book, there's a book called Wild Tending that's pretty old, but other than that, there's not really much information about it. And I'm gonna be willing to guess that Sam's got a book probably coming out at some point in the future about wild tending. I could, I, he, I just imagine that he has to have one coming. Yeah, Tending the Wild, that's right. I see that comment there. That's that's the book, yep. So um, as far as that is concerned, there's lots of information you can find online though. And I believe one of our other presenters here has some videos that are pretty cool about um, tending the wild in, on the West Coast if I'm wrong, correct, right? 
Yeah, I think you might be referring to Kelly, who's our last presenter yeah. on Sunday. Yeah. Um, but yeah, glad someone threw in Tending the Wild by Kat Anderson. That's definitely an epic book. Um, Mayan Forest Gardening is another one that someone is, is throwing out there. So, and then, yeah, Mark is uh, telling us about, or going to link to Kelly's podcast. So definitely a good one to check out. Um, another question here. Someone said, hey, Clay, any idea why pawpaws haven't populated in the wild further east than Pennsylvania and I'm not sure that that's necessarily true as I'm reading it because they are farther yeah. east than that. I think that they are east uh more east than that they might be rare for instance my mom lives in New York state and papa is uh recorded to be in in New York state where she lives which is farther east than than uh or she lives farther east than than Pennsylvania, I believe, if you were to look at a map. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's just straight north of it. But um, I, I know that there's pawpaws farther east. I know pawpaws are another example of a plant that was spread around the country. And uh, and somebody, I see that right there. Somebody wrote iNaturalist. Yeah, so I would, uh, I would definitely go to iNaturalist. If any plant that I've ever had trouble finding, you can go to iNaturalist. And it seems like that's the greatest hack for every forager to know. <laughs> for sure yeah iNaturalist is basically where you're able to see where people have recorded different sightings of different plants and it also goes into like animals and birds and even insects and, and spiders and stuff like that too so it's a really excellent yeah. resource I haven't really used it too much for foraging but people give away some spots on iNaturalist yeah um pawpaws pawpaws are an example of something that um we know for a fact Native people cleared around pawpaws and made them extraordinarily more abundant than they than they currently are. Um, I've seen in Grand Rapids, Michigan, we have understory that can be covered in pawpaws, but you barely find any pawpaws on them because they're so covered in the shade. Oh, and I see that. That's a good comment right there. All this stuff by Zach Elfers is pretty awesome stuff too. He's a he, he's a a, a great person to read you know as far as uh for a wild tending stuff goes excellent yeah and people are given all sorts of locations of where they find pawpaws that are a little further east so I, I will say here in north carolina we don't have a ton of them growing in the wild here in western north carolina um, but people are planting them more and more and we're seeing more and more mature stands that people of this, you know, recent generation have planted. So it's really is one of those fruits that just captivates people's taste buds so much that they want to, you know, plant them. Could you speak to a little bit about um, how you stratify pawpaw seed and how you work with it? So pawpaw is the same exact thing. I take them and just out of, just out of ease and because I don't want little rodents to eat all my seeds. I plant them in Ziploc bags in my fridge in moist soil. Um, anybody could do this outside. You could just plant them straight into the ground right outside. But then what ends up happening is, so say you live in a wooded area and there's tons of squirrels around you and you plant something like uh, hazelnuts. Well, say goodbye to those hazelnuts. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not gonna be around. Uh, pawpaws are, are not eaten by anything as far as I know, the seeds. So they're pretty safe to plant right outside. Um, but it's much easier to just have them in a Ziploc bag in your fridge, in in my opinion. And then you can control where they sprout. You put them into each little tray and you don't have to worry about any of that. Um, but I will say that um, I've talked to, so pawpaws are not native to where I live in Northern Michigan, but they're, they are native to Southern Michigan. and that's another one of those paradoxical things where they tend to grow and thrive in shady places, but they tend to only produce lots of fruit in sunny places. So um, it's pretty paradoxical. Yeah, totally. And to my understanding, the idea is that you want to plant the saplings underneath some other kind of a tree where it's going to be shaded for its first few years and then be able to cut down that larger tree so they can get sunlight later on so um yeah there's some subtlety to working with those and I've, I've used the same stratification methods and seen really good results putting them in the fridge and soil 
And I've had friends who put them outdoors and tried to just let it naturally overwinter and they had much uh, lower germination success. So I think the fridge is a pretty useful modern, modern technology for the seed stratification. Um, Definitely. Yeah. And if people have other questions um, for Clay, he's obviously a wealth of knowledge on so many different things, but um, please drop them in the chat. I'm, I'm following along with the chat pretty well, but I might be missing some questions. So don't take it personally. If I missed your question, um, just go ahead and put it, um, put it back in the chat and I'll, uh, I'll relay it to Clay. But uh, if no one else has a question right now, um, I would love to hear anything you'd like to share about hunting and fishing, um, because we actually don't have anybody talking about that um, throughout the Forager Summit. And I think that's a really fascinating part of my foraging journey is that I've gone from, you know, plants, fungi, nuts, acorns, all these different things, and just keep coming around to the point that, wow, like if I was really going to live off the landscape, especially in these cold climates, I would, I would have to be hunting and fishing for my fats and protein and all that, and, you know, significant calories, especially in the winter. Um, so yeah, I would love to hear anything yeah. that you have to share about that. Um, as far as, you know, maybe what you've been hunting or fishing, um, in the past few months or just any thoughts about that as it relates to wild tending too. I have a lot of thoughts about wild tending and hunting. And I, I actually think that it's extraordinarily beneficial in, in certain aspects, you know, obviously we had market hunting. It was terrible for the animals and it was terrible for our environment. So um, having that knowledge of what we, how we can hunt and, and sustainably hunt so that it, so that it becomes a good thing, you know, like it's the same exact thing. Like I said, with the, we need to be able to think, how can we take and make that take positive? And one of the things that I hunt a lot, which is frowned upon is squirrels and squirrels are a really fun thing to hunt. My uh, 11 year old son loves to go out and I've inspired him to become like a, have an interest in hunting just by taking him out hunting squirrels. Um, and then what is the net benefit is that again, the squirrels plant a lot of nuts and every squirrel that you harvest from the wild is a, is a nut tree that gets planted and turns into another tree that um, can then grow and feed more animals later on. Or, or conversely, you can thin that tree, you can do all kinds of things. And then squirrels are extraordinarily fecund. You know, they have, they have a large litter sizes. They expect, even without humans, uh, up to like a 75 or 80% mortality rate per year. So I'll, I'll, I get a lot of pushback on hunting squirrels by some, when I post on Instagram. Um, but the reality is that hunting squirrels is a sustainable activity. I'm not telling everybody to go out and shoot every single squirrel you can find. <laughs> you know, that, that, that's, that would be ridiculous. You know, only take what you need to eat. Uh, yeah, fried squirrel legs. Awesome. That's, uh, that's, a, great, <laughs> that's a great thing to eat. Um, and then the other, the other thing that we often do is deer which are extraordinarily overpopulated. Now I'm, I'm a terrible deer hunter, so I'm not the good, um, I'm not a good example. I see my friend Luke Oswald is on the talk here. Uh, he's a, an amazing deer hunter. He shoots many per year and I think he's doing a, a, a good service. You know, we have, we have places in the Midwest that are overpopulated and you, you have a lot of undergrowth of forests that can't, uh, can't thrive in the presence of that many deer. So, um, it's hard as a forager and I didn't, I didn't grow up as a hunter. So I'm, I'm assuming the same things for you. You grow up, you probably at one point were like a vegetarian or a vegan. And then you like slowly come to the realization like, Oh boy, foraging and hunting are like, they go hand in hand. You're like, how can I, uh, how can I do this and like feel good about myself? You know, and then it's a very hard transition to make. Now I've been hunting for, uh, 12 years now and I just started with squirrels and then I started fishing and then I you know all that other stuff and it's kind of like become second nature to me but I'm still a terrible deer hunter so um, uh, but uh, hunting hunting is amazing for the environment and it keeps uh, it keeps some animals in check but we should also keep ourselves in check and not come up with these silly reasons that you hear on a lot of like hunting podcasts you know like you don't need to pretend you're some sort of 
hero for the world for every animal you shoot. Yeah, I see Jem Davis, your hunting's, yeah, I, I know she's a, she's a really good hunter. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all that. Um, yeah, we don't have a whole lot of like hunting and fishing stuff built into this, but I think, like you said, it's an integral part of the foraging landscape. And uh, I think you had commented on one of my posts a while back when I had showed some squirrels that I had shot, which is also a really new endeavor for me in the past few years. And um, you were mentioning those numbers of how many, like you kind of just touched on, of how many nuts that squirrels eat in the forest and how they can really um, reduce the population of, you know, acorns and black walnuts and things like that. So, um, you know, a certain amount of, a certain amount of take is like giving back basically. And I think that's really the point, um, that's being made here. And, you know, when we get into trouble with these things, it's always been around, um, commercial hunting and people taking these things for, um, you know, long, sending them long distances to other people and selling them and making an economy around them, which, you know, can also be, helpful in certain contexts as well, but has traditionally been the way of eradicating different species. Um, so yeah, that's something that I've seen more and more just, yeah, get frowned upon, but I want to see more and more people coming together um, with these kind of common values and understanding that, you know, hunting and fishing can be a really, really important part. And it's also some of the, the best nutrition that you have. Um, and on that note, I'm not any pressing questions right now but um any favorite food, favorite things that you've been foraging or, or cooking or anything like that you like to talk about um well in in our winter here as opposed to your winter we're usually covered with a lot of snow and it's very cold <laughs> so diet the diet tends to become because i do like to eat as local as possible I, I try my hardest to eat like uh, everything, you know, so we end up eating a lot more meat. So um, one thing that we have cooked like crazy is just venison and then, and then wild rice because I harvest wild rice. So I, we do a lot of wild rice and a lot of venison. And then, you know, we obviously do buy food at the store still because like, you know, I'm not Amish or something. Like I can't, I can't like uh, sustain my whole family uh, off foraging which is another point that people should realize, you know, if you're going to get into foraging, like I got into it thinking that I was going to just like do it on my own and I'm going to eat everything 100%. And I don't think there's any forager out there who does that. You know, um, I don't know anything about deer leg prosciutto, by the way. So I saw that. Um, I can't answer that. I've never made prosciutto. <laughs> Sounds amazing. Um, Cool. That sounds great. And yeah, I'm, I'm in the same camp with you trying to eat as much local as I can, but just recognizing that it's, it's, it's horribly um, difficult, especially in really cold climates, especially during the winter time. And just given the context that we live in, in the world and we have to make money and, you know, drive cars and stuff like that. And that is, you know, it's tough, but we do the best that we can. And um, it's cool to see people who are out there just pushing those edges more and more like you and some of the other people who are just eating as much wild food and local as, as possible. Um, I didn't see any other questions. Go ahead. I was just going to say that um, just, I guess if I was to say like one last thing about wild tending, it's that um, it is extraordinarily important for us to reestablish this love of uh being outside and we'll love it more if we can go out there and participate in it. The, um, one of the things that I always try to tell people in my foraging classes in general is that if you don't enjoy doing it and you don't bring back food that you really like, you're not going to keep it up. And I think that we are an integral part of the landscape, like I said, with the beavers um, and our we can do good out there and we can make a world that's just covered. Like uh, I would recommend everybody go and look at the first description of what Detroit looked like by Cadillac. He talks about how the, the whole entire Detroit area was basically covered with edible plants, you know, and again, like that's probably not like some accident. Um, and uh, wild plums everywhere, hazelnuts everywhere. 
that's a that's a beautiful image and uh yeah that's an incredible message so thank you for including that um and also before before we sign off um or before we end the interview with you uh, is there anything you want to direct people to as far as you got classes coming up you have um uh, anything else you're excited about that you would like to share with people so they can keep in touch with you and possibly come up for a class so i'm doing as usual, I do foraging classes throughout Michigan, but then this year I'm also going to be expanding out doing, um, uh, last year I did my first class out of the state. I went to Louisville, Kentucky, and I'll probably be doing more Kentucky classes. I know for a fact that I'm going to be putting up in the next few days here, a class in like Athens, Ohio area in April. Um, I'll probably be doing a class in New York state, um, because I, I, my mom lives out there anyway. So I uh, will be gone ar all around the place and hope, hopefully in the years that come, I can have uh, a greater knowledge of the West Coast species and I can even go out there and start doing some classes. But right now I wouldn't feel, although I will be in Los Angeles at the end of February doing some filming with another one of our speakers. Um, uh, I, uh, I uh, don't I, I don't feel confident enough to like lead a class out there while I'm out there, which would be fun, but I, I'm not confident enough. Yeah, truly. Who's the other speaker that you're doing some filming with if you're able to give us some information? I will give you a little information about who it is, but I can't tell you what it's for. It's uh, okay. Jess Starwood. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Cool. Cool. Yeah, we got Jess on tomorrow. And yeah. um, can, uh, can people find just nomiforager.com? Is that right? Yep. And then on um, Facebook and Instagram. And um, I also have a Twitter apparently, <laughs> but I, I never, I, I, I don't sign up on, on it ever. I just post my classes straight from my website and they go to Twitter. So I don't even know if people send me messages or anything on that platform. Okay. Got you. So Instagram and Facebook are better places to find you. That's at Nomi Forager. Is that right? No me forager. Uh, no, it's uh, at clay two underscores Bowers. Got it. Got um, it. I'm, okay. We'll put it on the chat. Yeah. And then, um, and then uh, on Facebook, it's just clay Bowers. Yeah. Got you. But, cool. Um, got those in the chat for people. Go ahead. Um, and yeah, a couple of people acknowledge that it's your birthday today. and wanted to sing happy birthday. I'm not going to subject you to that over zoom but I just want to say happy <laughs> birthday to you on behalf of everybody in the chat who um, wanted right. to make sure that was acknowledged. And uh, thank you for spending a few hours with us on your birthday, man. Um, really incredible, incredible work. And I'm really inspired and looking forward to coming up for a class at some point and uh, doing Great. some fishing or hunting together, foraging together. So thanks a lot, man. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds amazing. All thank right. You guys. You, Clay. All right. And you guys, like I said, you can find him in the chat um, at nomiforager.com or at clay two underscores Bowers. Um, follow him on there for more information. Definitely connect with Clay. As you see, he's just a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of inspiration. And uh, we're really, really grateful to have him. Uh, happy birthday to Clay. Thank you guys for reminding me of that. Um, so someone was asking another question, which we missed, but um, I don't imagine that you would really be able to answer this anyway, but they were asking, we had huge forest fires in Greece this summer. Is there anything we can do to help the burned forest? Um, we'll hold that question for sort of later in the, in the summit. Um, so we do need to start moving on to our next presenter, which is Nikki Hill. Um, but yeah, hopefully we'll get to everyone's questions. Um, as we move forward. And let's see, I'm not sure that I'm gonna do the breakout room thing. I'm imagining you probably wanna move on with your birthday clan if I have some other plans. So um, people can connect with you on, on Instagram. I guess they have further questions and wanna connect. Um, all right, so we have Nikki Hill coming up next. We're gonna have a word from one of our sponsors before we uh, get into her presentation, but I'm uh, really excited to hear from her. And our sponsor is uh, the Numinous Experience. And, you know, the sponsors have really helped us to be able to fund this thing. Um, 
and to keep this as a free experience for everyone. So we really appreciate them. Uh, the Numinous, Numinous Experience is Jess Davis, and she offers holistic coaching and psychedelic integration for those navigating challenging circumstances or wish to gain deeper insights. Her background as a therapist for individuals and couples colors her work, which is trauma-informed, mindfulness-based, and infuses play and creativity. Jess offers a grounded approach to spirituality where she delights in the work of co-creation and evolution for deeper connection to yourself, to others, and to the ecosystem of your life. And Jess is a personal friend of mine um, who I've known for a few years. She's a real being. So definitely, if you're interested in that kind of thing, um, if you're interested in coaching and you know transformation, Jess is an awesome person to connect with. She's offering online um, different packages and sessions. So you can connect with her from all around the world. And I'm going to drop her links into the chat so you can check out her website. All right.